All right. Uh, good afternoon. At this time, I will call the City Commission uh, workshop, which has been duly posted and scheduled for October the 11th at 4.30 p.m. to order. Uh, was there any city, uh, is there any citizen the communication workshop. for the workshop? None. None. Not Thank you. Me. Item one, presentations from the following top three golf course architectural firms pursuant to the city's request for qualifications number 2021-20 for the Tony Butler Golf Course Design and Project Management. Yes, Mayor. Here? Yes, Mayor, City Commission. Um, before the, the workshop, um, we asked the three um, firms to uh, pick a number and so Golfscape uh, chose number one and so he'll do his presentation and then he'll he'll leave the room and then we'll bring the next one in and so on and so forth so um, Jeff? Uh, Before we start I have a question is this for the 18 holes or those last nine of the 27? It's, it's for the 18 holes okay. Thank you. All right, welcome Thank you. It's good to be here again. I think most of you know that I was the sub-consultant to the <coughs> National Golf Foundation uh, when they did the business study that got this thing rolling. And I think that's an advantage to our <coughs> firm because, you know, the step one in any design is doing a thorough evaluation of the golf course. And, uh, well, I've already done that. And I know we want to get this thing started and grasped early enough to uh, capture that winter Texan market next year. Like I said, I was here with the NGF. I mean, I saw their study. Um, as you can see, Tony Butler has some very low customer satisfaction rankings. Uh, most of it is due to the quality of the greens, which looked better yesterday when I got here, uh, and the, uh, well, the drainage and the irrigation. I stayed with you via phone calls and, and various letters and helped you set the original budget. Uh, Javier had the wisdom to uh, bump it after three years, you know, 15%, which uh, not all cities do. You know, they give you a low budget and then they uh, keep it, you know, and sometimes don't get started until five years later. So we feel comfortable about the program. We feel comfortable that this is the path you should take, addressing your critical needs. I mean, golfers, they like green grass, they like their greens to putt well, and they like their sand bunkers. And, of course, they don't like to get their expensive golf shoes wet. And again, NGF studies show that if you properly address your biggest concerns on a golf course, uh, you get the best return on investment. So I think you are on the right path. So let's just take a look at what we're proposing, you know, for these top priorities. Irrigation is number one, one, and one. I mean, I think we all know the system is very old and it's just time to replace it. There's no hope for it. Now, your pump station is not as old by about five years, and we went in and examined it yesterday and today. And we're of at the attitude that uh, if we can save something and make it work and not spend money on it, we're not going to. Uh, and the, your pump station is kind of a tweener. But we are probably bid the project out for a new pump station with an alternate. We'll bring in some pump specialists, and if they can keep that pump running for 10 more years, well, then we'll save you that money and, and use it other important places. Uh, your irrigation system does not look any better from the airplane view. Uh, the donut pattern here uh, is typical of an under-designed system, a poorly designed system, and an old system that doesn't have enough pressure. Uh, this is Tierra Santa down the street in Westaco, happens to be one of my designs, and with the irrigation, uh, you know, designed to, with better coverage, coverage everywhere, and this is what we think Tony Butler deserves. So. With that, I'm going to bring in Ben McCampbell of McCampbell Irrigation. He's going to describe, just for a few moments, uh, some of the more specific proposals. Thanks, Jeff. Um, as he mentioned, I'm Ben McCampbell. Um, I've been designing golf course irrigation systems for more than 20 years in Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas, and I happen to live in Laguna Vista. I've been playing this golf course for 40 years and know it very well. And I uh, want to do what I can to um, make it green. That's, that's what I do is make it green. There are two things specifically. Jeff mentioned the, the, the donut, the circles. One, th one, ways, one of the ways that we can uh, mitigate that, the big problem we have in that regard is wind. And as you all know, it's constant. It's usually at least 10 miles an hour, and you can pretty much 
count on two hands the number of dead calm days we have in a year. So instead of, of the normal spacing, which is called 50%, and this is going to get a little technical, 50% of the diameter, every sprinkler head in the world, whether it's on an athletic field or somebody's house or a golf course, ideally is spaced at 50% of the diameter or the radius, or in another way of putting it, it's the length of the spray. And so they do this, and that gives you even distribution. What I do with most of my projects in Texas is space at 45%. And that fights the wind. You'll never beat it, but it fights it, and it helps. And, and that's what we'll do here. It, uh, it will make them a lot less. You'll have a lot fewer uh, uh, donut holes than you do, and it'll look a lot more like Tierra Santa. The other major thing that I'll do with the irrigation system is specify HDPE pipe, high-density polyethylene. What you have now and what a lot of people have, most athletic fields, most houses, commercial things have PVC. And most old golf course systems are PVC. I've been specifying HDPE pipe for the last eight or nine, ten years, and it's been in use in this country for about 20 or 25. It does not leak. And what they're faced with right now, if you all have been to the golf course, you've seen leak after leak after leak after leak with the PVC irrigation system. HDP, HDPE pipe is fused. It's heat fused, so it actually becomes one piece of pipe in the entire golf course. The manufacturers guarantee it for at least 25 years, some 25, some 30. And the Plastic Pipe Institute of America says it should last anywhere from 50 to 100 years. It doesn't leak. That saves you water. It saves you energy, and it makes your irrigation system a lot more efficient. I don't really need to add a whole lot else to that, I don't think. It's going to be automatic, of course. It'll be computer I have a controlled. On yes, sir. HDPE. Is it fused at the site, yes. or does it come on a roll? It, both, actually. Uh, it comes in, uh, depending on the size of the right. pipe, right. the bigger two pipe comes, versus, comes in, yeah. in, in, in lengths, right. but the smaller pipe, like two and three inch, comes in reels. Some of them is, is 1,200 feet. 2,000 feet, depending on, on what the truck can handle. And it is heat fuse on site. It's fascinating to watch. You'll have a fuser, and to operate the fuser, you'll actually have a, a gas power generator. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are settings depending on uh, the pipe specs and the size of the pipe, uh, and that governs what the temperature is and, and how long you fuse it. But it's done on site. Yeah, I understand. It's like a ribbon rail on the Class A railroad. Yeah, it's been used in the gas industry for many, many years. Sir, may I ask a question? Does Westico, the slide you showed before, do, do they use that pipe? It wasn't common back in 1997. Okay. Or so. Yeah. Is anybody is anybody here in Texas using that that we can? I've done the last three projects that I've done. We've done it. Laredo Country Club. Mm -hmm. um, we did it in 2013. It's HDPE pipe. Carrizo Springs, which is 80 miles north of uh, Laredo, HDPE. And um, one I did last year way out in West Texas in Kermit, 50 miles west of Odessa, also has HDPE. I can give you the numbers of those people. You can call them if you want well, to. Maybe to, the, to Gabe would be one thing. Um, the cost difference between uh, PVC pipe and, and this particular process you're talking about, <coughs> is it double the cost, 40% more? No, it's a, that's a very good question, in fact. They, there used to be a greater disparity than there is now. It's almost the same. But the difference is the, con the installation of HTPE pipe is much more efficient because you have to connect PVC pipe every 20 feet. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, with this, you can do a whole fairway. Um, so you actually save on the labor and the material. Absolutely. A and, it, and it's a faster installation, too. Understood. Okay. Yeah, good question. Uh, any more on that? So we might be, you know, overreacting to your three leaks a day that you have out there. But, you know, our goal is to be when your great-grandkids are sitting in your chairs there, you know, they might have to worry about the irrigation system fixing it again. <coughs> so uh, we've always found that just better to use the highest quality materials. And, again, to answer your question, it used to be a 10% difference overall. That's narrowing as more contractors get qualified to, to uh, install it. And actually, one of the things we always do is we bid to the highest and best, and we'll probably bid to three, what we think will be $3.5 million, just hoping we get a good bid from a qualified contractor, and we will have alternate deductive bids. So if for some reason it's a forty or $50,000 deduct, we may leave that option open to go back to PVC, but we don't recommend okay. it. So I have a question on the, on the pump stations. 
did you evaluate the pump stations uh, as far as did you test the equipment and, and recommend <coughs> the motor maybe need to be replaced or not, or you simply given a cost to redo it all completely and, and just hoping that it works? Yeah. I mean, can you provide a, an estimate on actually testing the equipment because you don't want to open up and three months later have a problem with the pump if we didn't? Yeah, well, that. we haven't done that. Uh, you know, that's a question we will answer very soon in the design process. We don't guess at anything. We don't guess at whether your drain pipe under the surface is in, you know, has integrity. We're not going to guess at the sand mix, as we'll see here, that goes in the green or the bunkers. So we have not done that yet, but okay. we wouldn't. Because I understand. I mean, it's the heartbeat of the system, and there's no sense, you know, right. you know now, getting a new a, system. I have a question on the maintenance, and, and you're um, um, suggesting on whether we should or not. But, you know, as there are chemicals out there that we can apply to the grass that will help keep the absorption rate, you know. Right, right? wetting agents. Wet, right, exactly. Uh, insecticide use that thing and uh, I don't think we're doing that currently do you suggest we do something like that or, or, or the golf courses that you do uh, done have they done that in the past or I just want to I mean, know it's, it's, I, what I, what I, here's yeah. the question I'm asking there's stuff that we're doing on the maintenance side that, right that there's equipment out there or, or or treatments that we can do that'll enhance the greenery or whatnot yeah. and, and I think you know where I'm going with that so so can you provide guidance on that, whether we're yes. doing something proper or not? Give me about four more images, and I think I'll answer that question okay. for you, if that's all right. All right. Uh, and by the way, this is an example, City of North Richland Hills, Texas. Again, we did everything that uh, Ben was telling you. We went from two rows to three rows on the irrigation. We made sure we covered the area between the cart path and the fairways, uh, because it, you have a lot of areas you have not grown. It's a combination of the traffic. And, and poor irrigation. Uh, now drainage, uh, it's easy to show you on a, on a slide, you know, your problems. It's a little harder to describe solutions, especially at Tony Butler, because you've got three or four different kind of drainage problems to solve. But I'll tell you a story, I'll tell you two stories. One is Golf Week magazine called me the drainage nerd of golf course architects. Uh, this project was pretty well made for me to do with your drainage problems. Secondly, I came in yesterday, I, I reevaluated the course just to jog my memory, ran into one of your golfers, he asked why I'm out there without any clubs. So I tell him I'm one of three candidates, uh, you know, f for, to do this project. So his response is, well, they ought to hire the guy who designed Tierra Santa. So he was there last week, last month, two inch rainstorm, and it was back in play in an hour. And we think we can do that. For, with Tony Butler. I mean, some of your problems are fairly simple. This is the little swamp in front of at t I mean, the lower photo shows you the proper relationship between, you know, lake and, and fairway. We're either going to have to raise that portion and a few others that far above the water table, or we're going to have to find a way to lower the lake. In other areas, I think we'll be able to drop catch basins in strategic places. In other areas, like 11 fairway, you've got a big drainage ditch across. We're going to have to put bigger pipe in and go. Greens, of course, big thing. Um, upper left is USGA construction, very expensive. I don't think it's going to be great value for you. Most of the greens we've built over the years are the upper right. It's called California greens, uh, which is just sand and maybe 10% you know, peat. Um, and then the lower one is something we've done successfully. It's used more often for tees, which get beat up too. And that's called the modern push-up green, where you put in four inches of sand over good topsoil. But I'm getting to think that maybe the cost of trucking in the good topsoil is not going to be any less than trucking in the, the 12 inches of sand for the California green. But that's how we're planning on improving your greens um, and enlarging them uh, without spending, you know, breaking the bank. To answer your question, um, on our team is Mr. Terry Buchan. If you read the proposal, you know, I'm not going to go over too much, but he's a master greenskeeper in Britain and here. He has prepared courses for U.S. Opens and PGA Championships. He has grown in 100 golf courses. Uh, and we envision his role to extend beyond construction. And so many times we've seen with municipalities, the architect leaves, the contractor leaves, and the superintendent who may or may not have a grow-in experience is left with a big, big job. Uh, no one's grown in more courses than Terry around the world. Uh, and I don't want to leave the impression that, uh, you know, he only does high-end stuff. Again, he's worked with me in Indonesia and in places with almost no resources and helped them bring their turf up. And the wedding agents, the questions, he will develop a total agronomy program for you. 
I know that you've had some discussion about leasing your equipment. Uh, he has done leasing plans and equipment replacement plans for maintenance. Uh, and like I say, to me, he's the secret sauce, I think, that makes our team the best because we know we don't look good unless you look good. And I just know from experience that he's going to make us all look good. Bunkers, I mean, they're even overtaking tees and, and golfers. Hearts and minds is the next thing they want to see. We are going to take your bunkers. You know, right now they're you call them more mud bunkers and sad bunkers. We're going to add a liner between the mud and, and the sand to keep it cleaner. Uh, whether it's a hard surface on the right or a, a cloth liner on the left, we prefer the hard surfaces if they're not too much more expensive. And while we're at it, we're going to improve the character of those bunkers. Uh, for some reason, everybody or whoever built these built the front of the bunkers up as high as the back. I mean, they need to tip it. I like this table right here. They need to tip at you if you're going to see the bunkers. Uh, they're just, I don't know who built them. They're poorly designed. So as long as we're in there working them, we're going to try to give them a little more character. Uh, I don't think we necessarily add bunkers because they are expensive to build and maintain. Again, go back to Tierra Santa, the grass bunkers and the shadow patterns and maybe fairway chipping areas and mounds. There's a lot of things we can do without over bunkering your golf course to improve its image with golfers. The other thing we plan to do is we know this is really phase one and you've got you know maybe the other the third nine. Uh, someday your cart path, your pump station, you know those are going to wear out and uh, we're going to plan ahead for all of that so that when it comes time to replace those cart paths, there's a logical plan to incorporate them in. I mean, a lot of times on flat ground, they build a cart path, and it blocks up more drainage than, you know, the problems yeah. itself. So, yes. You've got, you got two minutes. All right. Well, let me talk faster. Well, I'm almost done. That's, those are the highlights of the deal. Um, Tony Butler has got a great history. Uh, you know, it, it's got good bones. And, you know, I was pleasantly surprised after two years to come back and just remember there's lots of good holes out here. It doesn't need, like, major design overhaul. It needs tweaks. The, the valley is used so well on holes 6 and 10. And, again, we look forward to continuing our relationship with Harlingen. Um, I see a lot of potential to make Tony Butler, you know, one of the best courses in the valley, if not farther. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, do we have any other questions? Anybody have any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much for being here and, right. and for uh, submitting that proposal. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Javier. Who is it? Mr. Ross. Brian Ross. Is it Ross? Uh, Ross. Okay. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start off thanking Mayor Boswell, City Commissioners. Thank you guys for having me here today. Present my team's case for the Tony Butler Golf Course Renovation Project. My name is Brian Ross. I'm the president and owner of Ross Golf Design. I'm a, we're a full-service golf course design company based in Austin, Texas, and I'm joined here today by. A member of my team, my irrigation specialist, Ben McCampbell from Laguna Vista. So over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tony Butler Golf Course, what makes it special and deserving of this investment, and why I think my team and I are the best choice for you guys to lead this project. Okay. So golf at Tony Butler dates back to 1929. That's 92 years ago. The original architect was John Breedemus. Breedemus worked primarily in Texas during the early 20th century, and he was responsible for some other pretty historic courses across our state, like Colonial Country Club in Fort Worth and Memorial Park in Houston. So here's an aerial from January 1947. It's the earliest one I could find. And as you can see on the aerial there, the, the golf course really took up the northern portion of the property that exists today. And you know, generally holds 19 to 27, then 1, 9, 10, 11, 18. And during the mid-1950s, they expanded the course to the south a little bit, and they reconfigured it a bit, and that makes up the land generally around holes 3, 8, and 17. And then finally, 1973, the course was expanded again, and they added the large triangular piece on the southern end of the property. 
generally encompasses holes four through seven, 12 through 16. And of course, 1973 is also when the golf course was renamed Tony Butler Golf Course. And then finally, here you have Tony Butler Golf Course today. And this was an image from February of this year. Now, I've played Tony Butler twice in the last few years in anticipation of this project, so I have a few thoughts I'd like to offer on the golf course and ways I think we could improve it. I'll start with a quote from the father of golf architecture in America. His name's Charles Blair McDonald. Putting greens to a golf course are what the face is to a portrait. Greens are the lifeblood of a golf course. They can overcome a poor routing, and great greens can overcome a featureless site. Now, fortunately, Tony Butler is neither of those. It's a, it's a really enjoyable property, and it's good routing. But I'd rank the greens here well below average when compared to the hundreds of other golf courses I've seen and studied. The greens are quite small. I did a quick analysis, and the average size of the putting greens at Tony Butler right now is 3,850 square feet, which is over 2,000 square feet smaller than the industry average of 6,000 square feet. Now, that's part of the charm of Tony Butler, but it also has some challenges. So small greens limit where you can place the pin, meaning you don't have a lot of difference in the day-to-day -day setup of the course. And they can also lead to compaction issues as golfers gather around the same places on the green day-to-day. -day. Now, Tony Butler doesn't need to have the biggest set of greens in the world, but I will seek to expand the size of the greens to help produce more strategy, more enjoyment, and more variety for the golfers of Harlingen. So Tony Butler has 24 sand bunkers and totals just over about a half acre of sand. And in my opinion, this is a pretty good place to be as a municipal golf course. So I wouldn't seek to increase either the number of bunkers or the acreage by much. But I will take a hard, long look at each of those bunkers to make sure they make sense from a strategic and from a maintenance perspective. Many of the bunkers seem disconnected from the golf hole, which may mean you have a fairway bunker that's just a little too far off the fairway, or some of the greenside bunkers seem just a little too far away from the green. Many of the bunkers also lack visibility in many instances, and they tend to exist more like a saucer. And that, that makes access difficult for both golfers and for your maintenance staff. So if hired, we would rebuild each bunker to ensure it's more visible, easier to maintain, and that exists to reward a great shot, not just penalize a poor one. And then let's, lastly, let's talk briefly about tees. So T square footage is quite limited on many holes. The blue and white tees tend to have more tee space, and the gold and red tees tend to be on very small tee boxes. And there are also some questions about equity for senior women and junior golfers. At only 6,320 yards, Tony Butler is not a long golf course by any means, but from the red tees at 5118, that's a pretty that's a pretty long golf course for women. I'd like to see that set of forward tees somewhere in the 42 to 4500 yard range. So I'll work to provide ad adequate areas for these tees so that they don't come off as just an afterthought. And then I'd also like to see a set of junior tees added up in the fairway as well. Okay, so we have a pretty good understanding of the golf course now. Let's get to the important part. Why should you, the city of Harlingen, hire me and my team to guide you through this project? The answer is quite simple in my opinion. My team and I are going to provide you with a level of attention that's unparalleled in this industry. A multi-million dollar golf course project is a complex operation. There's a lot of moving pieces, especially when you have irrigation system being installed as well as golf course features being built. And you know what the most important lesson I've learned from all my years in golf course design and construction is? It's that you just have to be there. That's why I've built my business and this team to ensure that we're there when needed and not just for a day or two here and there. We'll spend more time on site during both the design and construction than anyone else in this industry. That's a commitment that I make to every client and that's a commitment that I make to you all today. This process will start on day one. Oops, sorry. Immediately after the contract is signed, I'll arrange to spend seven to 10 days on site completing a thorough analysis of the golf course. I'll get to know both the property and the people charged with its upkeep. I'll walk each hole, identifying each golf course feature, each tree, every irrigation head, so that I understand this place backwards and forwards. I'll spend a significant portion of my time observing golfers and how they play the golf course. We'll develop a, a thorough understanding of not only where golfers do hit their golf ball, but where they don't. My team and I will complete course walkthroughs with all relevant ownership, operations, maintenance personnel. 
These walks are intended to be candid conversations, and the main priority being that we want to align the priorities of everyone prior to starting the design phase. We want to get everyone's opinion. We'll also use this time to begin creation of a base map. We'll stake features using GPS and establish a topographically accurate depiction of the property. During the design development phase, we'll work hand in hand with you guys to establish a project budget that can meet all the goals set forth in the discovery phase. Every decision made from that point forward will be with this budget in mind. We'll pour over the details. We want to try to maximize the size of the features we can build. We want to maximize the coverage that we can get on our new irrigation system. But all of that must be done within the constraints of that budget. Our agronomist is one of the most respected men in the Texas turf industry. From day one, he'll work alongside your superintendent and staff to ensure that we're putting them in the best possible position to grow turf grass in this area. We'll also establish a great accurate 3D computer model of the proposed course during this phase. You can see here, it's just a little quick rendering I threw together of what a potential before and after on the sixth hole could look like. These models are great for conveying ideas that can sometimes be hard to pick up from a 2D plan. And this will help show all the stakeholders, you guys, the residents of the city, what the vision for the proposed golf course is. Once all parties are satisfied that we've developed the plan as thoroughly as possible, we'll move into construction documents. My team and I will produce a construction document, technical specification bid set that's as thorough as anyone in this business, and these documents will be the first thing referenced when a question arises during construction. We'll personally walk the city through the bid process, ensuring that only the most highly regarded and competent golf course and irrigation contractors are able to bid on your project. Once construction begins, our team gets even stronger. My company will provide the city with a golf course shaper to handle the layout and construction of all golf course features. Think things like greens, tees, bunkers. Our shaper will be your eyes and ears on the ground. And they'll work hand in hand with the contractor and the golf course superintendent on a daily basis to ensure that we're staying on time and on budget. I will personally be on site for a minimum of two days per week, every week, and often much more. For example, I would plan to be on site for the first three weeks of the project at a minimum to ensure that we get off the ground running, and I will spend similar longer visits during other critical periods. In addition, I will personally finish shape every green to ensure they're built exactly as intended. A typical irriga irrigation designer might make four or five visits to a site during construction. They're going to lay out their grid, inspect the work that's been done, GPS the installation of heads and pipe. Our local irrigation specialist Specials will be on site weekly to ensure that the project is up to our high standards and that the system has been installed as intended. Once construction is over and the grow-in is commenced, we don't just disappear either. My agronomist, the irrigation team, and myself will be on site frequently <coughs> during grow-in. We'll help answer any questions, ensure your superintendent's comfortable with his new course and the new irrigation system he's been handed. If you hire me and my team, you're signing me up for a lifetime commitment to you and your golf course. I'll do everything in my power to make sure this project is a success and that Tony Butler is around for 92 more years for the golfers of Harlingen to enjoy. So with that, I'd like to thank you again for your time. Thank you. All right, does anybody have any questions? Uh, do, do you have any projects under, currently underway? I, I, I'm finishing a project right now in Kentucky that's been a really for the last year and a half is a total rebuild, very similar to this project, in fact. All new greens, tees, bunkers, regrass, the pole plays, new irrigation system. Uh, we've basically wrapped up construction on that. I've got one more visit to make, and, uh, and then we'll have be you, done. Have you encountered uh, increased construction costs? And yes, construction costs have gone up. I think the primary thing that we've seen is in trucking and materials. We've had a, not a difficult time necessarily getting them, but there seem to be fewer drivers available to bring materials, and that's so, you know, the drivers that are available are at a higher rate than they have been. Okay. Sorry, Where in Kentucky? Uh, it's in Park City, Kentucky, which is south central, just near been Bowling there. Green. Okay, yeah, right by Mammoth Cave. So I appreciate your presentation. It's very detailed. Thank you very much. I appreciate the, the level of detail you provided. Thank you. Okay, any, any other questions for Mr. Ross? All right, thanks a lot okay. for Thank being you here. We appreciate much. you coming right. down uh, to make the presentation. Thank you.
Mr. Jeffrey Bloom. Uh, wel welcome to Mr. Bl Mr. Bloom. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Mr. Mayor. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, go through this fairly quick because I know in the interest of time we, we need to get, uh, get through it. So see if I can get this thing working right. Um, my name is Jeff Bloom. I'm an uh, architect out of Houston. Uh, I'll go through this, like I say, real fast. First I'm going to do is introduce our team, uh, the members of our team. I think we've got a, a pretty interesting team and uh, some guys who have a whole lot of experience with the golf course out at Tony Butler. We'll show a little bit about some representative projects that we have uh, and that we've done in the past, a real brief discussion of our design process, some of the specifics about Tony Butler, uh, and then just some real quick before or after photos to finish up the presentation. So first, I'll uh, just talk a little bit about myself. I've been a golf course architect for 32 years uh, with new course, renovations, master planning, all of those things. Been a member of the American Society of Golf Course Architects since 2006 was on the executive committee for five years and president of the organization in 2018 and 19. I uh, was on the board of governors from 13 to 20 uh, and was a uh, representative for ASGCA with the USGA Pace of Play initiative, which is pretty important when you start talking about municipal golf. I was a member of the Houston Golf Association for nearly 20 years and the tournament general chairman of the Shell Houston Open in 2009 and 10. I've uh, been a member of the South Texas Golf Course Superintendents Association uh, and then with the USGA was on their C construction education committee, the green section pace of uh, play committee and have presented at their innovation symposiums uh, multiple times. Uh, and now I'm going to let uh, Ben real quick, our irrigation designer talk, and then I'll get back up and, and follow up after that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, as this mentioned, I've, I've mentioned before, I'm in an interesting situation where I'm on all three teams, but uh, it, <laughs> <laughs> but it makes perfect sense because Who do you the, recommend? I'm sorry? Who do you recommend? Um, I was just going to say <laughs> just going to say I am the constant in this equation and um, I'm remaining neutral because I have confidence in all three of these gentlemen um, but uh, the next nearest irrigation designer I think is about 600 about 400 miles away up in East Texas and so it, it's uh, I know the golf course I've been playing it for 40 years uh, I want to see golf succeed in the city of Harlingen. I think you've got a wonderful golf course. I've always liked it, um, and I want to do whatever I can do to, um, uh, to make sure that it stays green and it stays consistently green. And that, uh, of what I mentioned a little bit earlier, we will space a little bit narrower than is the in industry standard because of the wind. And secondly, we'll use HDPE pipe, which does not leak. And um, like I said, I'm 30 miles away from the golf course. Um, one thing, the, the bottom thing, certified irrigation designer, uh, I carried that certification for 20 years as a certified golf irrigation designer, certified golf irrigation auditor, which d uh, gives a test to the distribution efficiency of the sprinkler heads. Uh, that's why you see those circles that we, that we saw earlier. Um, and also was a commercial, um, certified commercial irrigation designer. Um, anyway, uh, and a member of the Texas Turf Grass Association for a long Sir, time. I will you, hand it. May I ask a question? Yes. In, in all three designs, like I said, you're the constant. Did your design change it in any one of them? Or yes, it will. Okay. Um, okay, so, so every architect has preferences right. uh, in, in whether they like two row, three row, whether they like things that are spaced at, say, 60 feet or 70 feet, uh, whether they like um, uh, around the greens, lots of times we will do what's called in and outs, ins and outs. Ins mean you have four sprinkler heads usually that, that water only the green, and the outs uh, water the outside. Um, that usually takes about eight heads. Some, uh, some golf course projects, and this will be part of the budget uh, consideration when we look at that because you can do it with only four heads and just water the green and the surround at the same time. That, that's not quite as efficient, use, <coughs> as efficient use of water as having both of them because you can't control the outside, and the greens need a little bit more water than, than the surround does. Okay, so I guess the, the question is, uh, let, me, let me rephrase my question. You're, you're doing irrigation. I know that the design layout may be different, but the process will be the same. Absolutely. It's just where, where the architect wants to put the water. Is that, is that the difference? Or, or is there a big difference in scope of work between the three projects as you're providing them? There wouldn't be much different. Okay. And, and 
there's also not a whole lot of difference in individual architects' tastes. Right. There's a little bit, but there's not a whole lot. Uh, because the basic principles of irrigation, like I mentioned, you need to have at least head-to-head -head spacing, uh, and we're going to do it a little bit narrower than that. Well, that narrows your options of how you're going to design because you want to you want to uh, put all the sprinkler heads at that spacing if you can, and you can. And so there won't be much variance between the tastes of the, of the three architects. Jeff. All right. Thanks. Uh, go through. I've got a couple other gentlemen here who are uh, born and bred in Harlingen, Texas. Renee Rangel uh, here. Renee and I have done multiple projects together over the years. Uh, Renee's a Harlington High graduate, Harling, Harlingen High graduate in 1988, a 20-year Class A uh, member of uh, the PGA. Uh, was golf letterman at the University of Houston. Uh, he's the current CEO of Sterling Golf Management. Uh, and he and I, as I said, have done uh, five projects together. The Mallard Cove or the Mallard Golf Club at the bottom there in Lake Charles. We just opened on Friday, uh, which is a municipal golf course. Obviously, Liber Liberty is, and uh, the golf club at Texas A&M is a, a government-run uh, golf course as well. So uh, that's Renee, and then Roman Robledo. Roman is Renee's nephew, also born and raised in Harlingen. Uh, very successful player down here, uh, University of Houston golf letterman in 2011 to 2015, was an All-American in 14, U.S. Amateur quarterfinalist in 14, U.S. Open qualifier in 17. Renee was also a U.S. Open qualifier in 1998. And both of these gentlemen learned to play at Tony Butler. And so when we started looking at this project from a design perspective, Renee and I having, having had a relationship for many years, uh, I thought it was perfect to bring them in. They're going to know the golf course along with Ben. Uh, better than anybody and so as we go through uh, and go through our design process they're going to have great input on that. Renee will also have a very big role uh, in the project management side of things uh, so we think we bring a very uh, local flair uh, with our team so that's the our team some of our experience just go through this real quick these are some of our new courses uh, the ones I've got in red there are ones we did with Renee um, and uh, the Grand Pines Golf Club up in Montgomery, Texas, one I'd mentioned, was the number two course in Houston uh, the year it opened. Uh, so we've had a lot of experience, some of it international as well. Uh, some renovation experience, uh, again, Golf Crest Country Club, uh, where Renee currently offices, uh, is one that we worked on together. Uh, Boiling Springs Golf Club in Woodward, Oklahoma, is another municipal golf course that was one of Golf Digest's uh, best new in 2014. And, the Texas A&M golf course that we did was best new in 2013. Uh, and then this is some of the stuff we're working on right now. We do an awful lot of work for the Municipal Golf Association in San Antonio. We're just finishing up Almost Basin Golf Course uh, up there. It will open in the beginning of November. Uh, we're getting ready to do the bunkers at Brackenridge Park. If you're familiar with that, that project will start in another month or so. We're still working on the Liberty Municipal Golf Course, the falls down in New Ulm, Texas, and then Wood Forest, which is north of Houston. Uh, these are some of the awards we've had over the years. Quail Valley Golf Course was one that was a uh, municipal golf course on a, on a site that was actually taken through eminent domain by the city of Missouri City in 2010, really turned that community around, uh, the Bentwater Project I talked about. And then we've also written a lot on golf course design. If you want to go to our website and read some of that, uh, we've done multiple articles in different countries. So. Uh, our design philosophy, just quickly, uh, we believe that golf architecture is a delicate balance between engineering and artistry. Uh, we've got to give the player a varied and inspirational tactical challenge. We've got to surround them with beauty. Uh, we've got to enable the operator to provide high quality conditioning with an economically viable budget. That's particularly important when you talk about city work. Uh, and they leave a minimal footprint on the surrounding environment. We're very uh, uh, concerned about that as well. Variety is the foundation of any good golf course. Tactical variety relates to distance, trajectory, and turn. Visual variety and what you see. Directional variety, how the holes play. And then topographic relief which, uh, and variety, which actually at Tony Butler, there's some good uh, topo to work with. So it's an exciting uh, palette to work on. Uh, hazard placement should describe the player how to play the hole, uh, but it should be interesting but not overly difficult. Uh, difficulty should, should arrive in peaks and valleys on the golf course so you don't get six holes in a row that are brutal. Uh, create an enjoyable experience for players is the overriding goal. Uh, in today's market, uh, creating flexibility within the course footprint so you can set things up and run things, uh, events in a different way is very important. 
And then uh, every great golf course is 18 varied tactical examinations and aesthetics that mold into one uh, comprehensive uh, course. Uh, so that's our philosophy. Real quick, some of the Tony Butler specifics. As I said, uh, our team has more familiarity with Tony Butler uh, than, than uh, anybody you're considering, mainly because of the guys that we have on the team. They're, they're all Harlingen uh, and South Texas guys and play the golf course on a regular basis. Because our team is Texas-based, we don't charge expenses if we're within the state, even though it is five hours to get down here. But it's not that hard to get down here. Uh, our team has completed multiple uh, municipal commissions together in the recent past. I myself have probably done more municipal work in Texas than any other architect. Uh, Renee Rangel and Sterling Golf bring a wealth of golf course operation, grow in and opening experience that can be very beneficial to the project in terms of uh, providing uh, 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 good uh, information uh, as you start to go through those processes. Uh, and then, as I said, we've completed a lot of municipal work. Uh, some other ones real quick. Uh, although the project is only uh, specified as 18 holes, we're going to look at that entire property. We know there was another nine holes. We talked with Rene and Roman about that. And what might be the best use of that property? It could be the third nine. Maybe there's something else we can do with it that can drive revenues uh, for the facility a little bit better. Uh, we did a project in San Antonio that is a nine-hole lighted par three out of the eight properties the Municipal Golf Association runs. It's the second leading uh, revenue producer of all of them. Uh, so we might want to look at something like that. Uh, all the design work uh, will permit future expansion of the facility depending on what you want to do with that property. And ben and I talked about that in our discussions. Uh, the maintenance and operational recommendations that we'll make uh, to the city of Harlingen, again, will come a lot through Renee and the Sterling Golf team. Uh, to help you get ready for grow in and preparation and they'll be working with your superintendent and your pro to help you get through that process that's something we can offer uh, all work will be done with USGA guidelines and uh, the design work will include conceptual planning construction documentation bid administration review uh, and the construction observation as well and just real quick I want to show you few examples of our work. This is the, uh, the property over in Lake Charles, Louisiana called uh, Mallard Golf Clubs. Brand new. That's the third hole. The eighth hole, they're getting ready for opening. Like I said, it opened on Friday. A uh, dead flat piece of property, but it's not flat anymore. We, we put a, quite a bit of contour into it. This is just another aerial view of the back nine. Uh, and this is holes four and five. So it's more of a Scottish Lynx style golf course over there. Uh, very quickly, these are some before and afters just to give you a flavor of what renovations may look like what we start with and what we end with this is a project that Renee and I did together in Houston called Sterling Country Club that's what it looked like in 2010 we did the work in 2011 so that's what that golf hole looks like today Lady Bird Johnson some of y'all may be familiar with Fredericksburg this is one we did in 2012 this was their old ninth hole again just kind of flat saucepan bunkers without much uh, character to them that's what that golf hole looks like today uh, Rockwall Golf and Athletic Club up, up on Lake Ray Hubbard in Dallas. Uh, this was one that had kind of been abandoned. That was their old 12th hole. That's what the 12th hole looks like today. And then Boiling Springs, this is one that was an award winner. It's up in a sand dune formation in Woodward, Oklahoma, another municipal golf course. Kind of had gotten into disrepair, but just a magnificent piece of property. That's what it had gotten to. This is what it looks like today. And just a couple more. Here's another one of Boiling Springs. This is their seventh hole. That's the seventh hole today. Uh, Lake Charles Country Club, very quickly. This was a hole we actually designed originally, came back and redesigned it to make it a little more ma maintenance friendly. That's what that hole looks like today. The finishing hole is a double green. Uh, that's what it used to look like. This is what we turned it into. Uh, and then the campus course at A&M, which is a project that Renee and I uh, worked together on, uh, dear, dear to my heart because I'm an Aggie. This is what it used to look like. These photos are a little old. Kyle Field looks a little different these days. That's their 18th hole. And then their finishing hole uh, on the other side, the ninth hole, those are the south side dorms. And that's what that hole looks like today. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, be happy to answer any questions or Renee and Roman and, and Ben as well. Uh, that's the uh, sixth hole list. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Bloom? Agronomy? Yes. Agronomy? Agronomy. Uh, Renee's team is fantastic with agronomy. Uh, they have grown in multiple courses of mine. 
uh, and they uh, they can provide a wonderful uh, expertise in that regard. I don't. You want to say anything? Sure. Yeah, yeah. We have we have our standards that we would pass on, obviously, to the project. Uh, our our goal is to, to have to provide the best golf course conditions for the best price. We work with uh, City of Panorama, as Jeff mentioned, City of uh, Lake Charles. We understand budgets. We understand that we got to keep it at a at a uh, minimum of. Expenditures on the golf course, so that the golf course can, can hold its own financially. Uh, but we start with the greens. The greens uh, are, are at all our properties are, are, are some of the best around in Houston and Lake Charles, and that's what we go about. And we have great practice. We have a great team of agronomists that will put together a schedule and program for uh, Tony Cup. I think one thing that's important to mention on that regard too is that. We're not trying to come in and change how you manage your facility. We're just providing expertise in that regard, and, and uh, that's how we can, can assist the project in another way. Okay. Anybody, have any, anybody on the commission have any other questions? Uh, tell us about uh, the, uh, what you're encountering with regard to construction cost increases. So uh, we've had a number of projects that have gone out to construction uh, bids here recently, uh, City of Liberty being one. Uh, that one was just right before the supply chain uh, problems started to be uh, encountered. Uh, what we have found, so cost-wise, we didn't see a big change there. Um, we have seen some since. Uh, I think the price of oil has something to do with it, too. You're putting a lot of plastic in the ground with pipe and and irrigation heads and things like that cost a little more to, to uh, take those in. Uh, but in terms of uh, the biggest impact, it's probably more uh, being able to get uh, the materials that you need on time. It's, it can be very difficult. Irrigation, for example, uh, they will not uh, guarantee prices more than about three or four days out right now, uh, if that. So it's, Sir, may, it's, I, may I ask the time of the scope of work? The I'm sorry? Of, the time from start to completion on the project? Uh, it really depends on what exactly you decide to do in, in its entirety, but typically what we will see on what was put into the RFP with the irrigation and with uh, the greens and bunkers and things like that, you're probably looking at somewhere between uh, six to eight months. So, um, so having known that, 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 because I understand the supply chain problem, but I think given enough, enough advance notice, you're able to pre-order and, and limit, limit the... Um, the obstacles I think you may have, right? Because the, the, the thing with construction is everybody needs it right now because they're building a house or building something. This is a laid out process, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know from day one what, what materials you're gonna need, you lay it out and you, you know, you, you get it ordered, right? And it's yeah, back so ordered. It, it, is, it is the delay of time. Right. And, and, and as one gentleman mentioned, it, it absolutely is, you know, there's, there's uh, in, in the restaurant business, there's warehouses of people, they have the product, they just can't ship it, have no drivers. Right. They can't fill it fast enough. Right. So, um, but I think, I don't think that, I don't foresee that as a problem very much because of the length of time of the scope of work. And that's why I was asking. Yeah. So what I would tell you, and, and you're correct there, what I would tell you is that, you know, you're going to go through a bid process to select a contractor. When that bid is accepted, that contractor has told you what those prices are going to be. Right. Same process we went through at the City of Liberty earlier in the summer. We have not had any price increases because those were locked in at mm -hmm. the time. Correct. Uh, all right. Does anybody have any other questions for uh, Mr. Bloom? All right, Mr. Bloom, thank you very much. We appreciate you all uh, being here for the presentation uh, tonight. The agenda item is pretty high up, uh, number five, uh, okay. if you don't want to wait around for the dis uh, hear and hear the discussion. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. All right. That concludes our workshop, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We will... Uh, uh, begin our regular meeting at 5.30, so we look, we'll, we'll take a short break, and at 5.30 we'll start the regular meeting.
Mayor, it's 5.30, Mayor. It's 5.30. All right. All right. At this time, I'd like to call upon Commissioner Renee Pettis to lead us in an invocation, please. God of wisdom, we seek your help today. Come and let your wisdom fall upon us. O oh Lord, as we gather for this meeting, give us clarity so that we can effectively tackle each part of today's agenda. Reveal problem areas and show us the best solutions that will apply. Point our eyes to every positive outcome since our last meeting and let these favorable results and developments encourage every heart in this room. Dear God, help us apply your wisdom as we decide on certain matters and make plans. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome all of you to our meeting tonight. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, this time, we'll formally call the meeting to order, uh, the meeting of the Harlington City Commission, which has been duly posted, and we'll go uh, to citizen communication. There we have Mr. Raymond Reyes, uh, 706 Nut Tucker Drive, Infrastructure and Accountability, and he would like to speak in person. Okay, Mr. Reyes, are you here? He's downstairs. Can, can okay. Go to, Go to the next one. one. Um, Donna Ray Leonard, uh, 4309 Minnesota Street. In regards to September 28th meeting, speak in, uh, speak in person. Okay. And please just state your name and your, and your residence address. Thanks. Donna Ray Leonard, Harlingen District 1. <laughs> The city commission meeting on September 28th was the worst display of a breach and decorum I have ever witnessed with local public officials doing the people's work. You fired the city manager. That's your prerogative. But if your intent was to publicly excoriate Mr. Cerna, then bring the receipts. Accusations and innuendo are not proof. Commissioner Uribe, your presentation was mostly debunked. Whether or not the city manager's dismissal was justified, the manner in which you conducted yourself was demonstrably unprofessional. <clears throat> you complained the city manager was disrespectful to you. Yet I sat in this meeting for five hours and you were anything but respectful to anyone. You disrespected the mayor, your fellow commissioners, the finance director, and a city contractor. Collectively, the whole board should be ashamed for participating in and allowing such unbecoming behavior. You talk over each other, you talk at each other, you insult each other, and you are constantly interrupting each other. One might ask if you even enjoy what you're doing here. Because what you project to us is highly contentious and inappropriate. Mayor Boswell, with all due respect, sir, we ask that you exercise more control over our commissioners and these meetings. Practice Robert's Rules of Orders and invest in a big gavel. I always encourage citizens to participate in local government, but no one wants to come here and watch hours of sniping, insults, and infighting between our elected officials. It's a waste of everyone's time. Commissioners, do not forget that you work for us. And we, the people, expect you to conduct our business in a professional and efficient manner. Two minutes are up, Mayor. We look forward to civil and orderly commission meetings in the future. We would all appreciate your cooperation in this manner. Thank you. All right. Thank you. The next one is Israel Aguilar, um, 28136 Cook Lane, item number seven, Mayor. I believe he's in person. He's not in person. He must be downstairs. Okay, Mr. Aguilar, well, we're calling him on number seven if he okay. gets here. Okay. Anyone else? I don't have no, no one else. All right, well, Mr. Martinez says that he has signed up, so we're going to let Mr. <coughs> Martinez speak. I'll get used to the new approach. It used to be signed up here. Uh, first of all, in the future, I think I think I told you this once before. I'm going to tell you again. I'm going to request all okay. again. Sure. 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 Sign up by four o'clock. Uh, submit it online or submit it. Uh, I person. would. I wasn't sure. I, I apologize. I'll correct myself. I was at the 
with the city of Browns who was an industrial. Okay, your time has started, so state your name and your Name is address. Desi Martinez. I submitted that information to you. Uh, I just want to make an observation to you that we're already paying for streets uh, monthly, even the low-income areas, all areas in our town. And uh, I, last month, uh, last week, or last month, I came by and asked you about the seed, uh, HUD monies that I didn't think that was. And then I see this in the newspaper. I said, you, you know, city manager, you and I have been around this business for years, 45, 30. And we know they are supposed to give you the right information to you and your committees to do the right job. And those people should not be paying 450 a month to taking their HUD funds that need to be go for rehab of the neighborhoods and their homes, et cetera. On the other, I'm, uh, on your comprehensive plan, I'm just going to leave some information. I'd like to help out as a volunteer to provide information. I work for counties, cities, and one of the fastest growing little towns in this county by providing information to everybody involved so that you can make policy. One is here, missed opportunities maybe, but uh, city managers should use all his abilities to bring information and talent that's in your communities to develop uh, uh, growth. And you have it. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's it, Mayor. Okay, we'll go next to a, uh, item number one, which is a proclamation proclaiming the week of October 3rd through October 9th, 2021, is Fire Prevention Week. Uh, Chief, if you'd, like to, if you'd like to bring your team up here, I've got this proclamation to present to you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Going to pass item two. Uh, the presenter is not available to, to be here tonight, so we'll get that another time. Item three is the approval of the regular uh, city commission meeting minutes of June 16, 2021. Is there a motion? Is, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? <clears throat> Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 As opposed, like sign the motion carries. Uh, Commissioner Puentes asked that item 4G from the consent agenda be removed, and so we'll just go ahead and go to that item consideration uh, and possible action to approve a contract with Don Van Ramshorst Jr. to operate, manage, and supervise the HEB Tennis Center for fiscal year 2022 and authorize the interim city manager to sign the agreement. Thank you, Mayor. And I just wanted to ask staff if we could go ahead and, because and, Don has been with us for, I don't know how many years, uh, and has done a great job. And so I wanted to, I don't know if I need to make a motion or, or request, then instead of just a one-year contract, if we could request, uh, request a two-year contract with maybe an evaluation at this time next year for, for uh, well, for an evaluation to, to uh, continue the contract, if that's okay with the commission. And so... Is it, do I need to make a motion? You need a motion to amend? Okay, so I'd like to make a motion to amend the contract to a two-year contract for uh, Don Van Ranchhorst. Did I pronounce that right, Don? For, uh, uh, to uh, operate, manage, and supervise the HB Tennis Center uh, for till 2024. The contract, yes. And I'll leave that up to staff. Okay, well, the, mo the motion was to, to, was to approve the contract as a two-year contract. Yes, sir. And we have a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. The motion carries. The balance of the consent agenda for items 4A through F and H. Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda? Motion. Se second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, like sign. The motion carries. Item five, consideration of possible action to allow the interim city manager to sign the contract with Alexander Cominos to weld, design, paint, and install a 26-foot-long art installation at Lozano Plaza. Hi, good afternoon. Um, this is Alexander Cominos. He's the artist. Um, I did speak to you all. Um, regarding what the CBB program was for the fiscal year 2022. In this, the uh, letters for Lozana Plaza were in it. We did uh, actually bring this plan to the board for the downtown and they have approved it. Um, I don't know, here's the board, excuse me. <laughs> All right, uh, so currently in Lozana Plaza, there is a, this is, this one. <coughs> I think you can see it uh, on the left-hand corner, there is a wooden structure. It is a, uh, a stage right now, but we would like to build a bigger, better stage in the backhand corner, but this is focusing on the current stage right now. It would be demolished, and we would have to ha pour a concrete slab there. In that concrete slab, in the same diagonal way that the current structure is, we would build an art installation depicting the words Harlingen. So as you can see here, it is a, um, a five-foot structure with a three foot letters and two foot base. This is the, uh, this was the initial idea that we were, that we thought of. And uh, John Piercy from Megamorphosis Architects uh, introduces Alex Caminos and Alex thought of a, a more interesting, more innovative way to depict the letters of the word Harlingen. So you can see, you could take pictures. This is an area for people to come from all over the valley and especially like when they're visiting um, for the Jackson Street Market Days and the Art Nights for somebody to take a picture and really just put our name out there everywhere. Is that lighted? 
Uh, yes, we will do uplighting, and there will be electricity in there, so you can have like an acoustic set. Uplighting meaning uh, like spotlights up. Um, so we would like to do on the bottom to show the letters. And the park itself is already lit up, could so this would just be on the bottom of the base to showcase the letters. Could you get a price on like the halo, because that's the most uh, common on the sign is the halo behind. That, that, that's LED and it's, it, it it it'll look real sharp. I mean, I don't know what the cost is. Yeah, but, we can get it. Look at that. You may want to may want to consider that because I think that would look good with the that halo on the back. So we definitely want to put electricity and the lighting in there so people can still do acoustic sets there um, during the all market days and everything like that. So if there's going to be a small band playing, they could play here. If there's going to be a large band playing, it would be in the, in the background where the big stage has been set. Um, so the letters, uh, the whole installation will be 26 feet long. It's going to be five feet tall in total. And uh, the steel base will have pitching on it, so there's no pooling of water, and hopefully we don't get any rust. Um, but Alex will be checking on it um, constantly, making sure that our structure stays in good conditions. Are, we, you, are you treating with an epoxy? Uh, I'm going to epoxy treat it, and also it's going to be automotive painted. So there's one thing that's wrong in the contract. It's not going to be powder coated for 20 well, well, but but what would what would the cost of because the powder coating would pay for itself just long term. To, to protect the, the... There's three foot by two foot by one foot. So if you take that, um, even getting it to a powder coater, you're tripling your budget. Um, I, I gave you... What's, what's the gauge of the steel or the, the metal you... Oh, it all depends. So I'm, I'm going to walk you through the process. So okay. this was the initial concept that John Percy put together through Megamorphosis, where you have really generic letters, which doesn't really do anything for the city of Harlingen, doesn't speak for the city of Harlingen, doesn't really talk about our art night or our community. So here's my design process. I took the initial idea and then I basically asked myself, when I think of Harlingen, what initially brought me here? Why am I here? When I think about Harlingen, I think agriculture, I think birding, I think technology, I think manufacturing. So I started to rework the concept, right? So from here, you see my initial sketches going in and working the different design processes for the letters, right? So for the letter H, and this is, I'm gonna step forward, um, I brought the treatments. So for letter, letter H, um, I went with uh, simple spherical shapes. So they're actually made out of pipe caps, right? So you take two pipe caps together, you weld them together, then you have a sphere. So what I like about the sphere basically, um, you know, if you wanna be intellectual or emotional or artistic about it, you know, it could be a standing for molecules, it could be a standing for people. And then letter blue, I didn't pick the right blue for Harlingen, but we can argue about color later, right? Uh, so um, that's a little bit of the design concept for two of the letters, right? Um, walking through it, um, Harlingen is a center for birding, right? So when people go to Harlingen, Texas, people go birding, right? So um, one thing we did talk about in the initial meeting was actually fabricating different metal birds, right? So there are going to be four additional birds added to the letters, right? So um, you know, little bits and pieces that are reminiscent of us, reminiscent of our city. What do you um, mean? What do you mean by added to the letters? Like are, they're just going to be like on top of the letters, or no? Well, here's the finish. Right, here's, here's a cactus motif, right? So you envision this three foot by two foot by one foot. I have a nice area where I can add, you know, some of our you know native species. No, not just the miscellaneous. You know, I'm not just putting a bird on it. Um, that's a joke from uh, our Portlandia. No. No. Never mind. Um, that's the episode right now. Um, anyway, so um, the star, um, I, we all know where the lone star takes. So rather than doing just the simple star, uh, we're going to do plow bits. So you weld two plow bits together and then bring the multiple bits together and then you create the, uh, the shape of the star. Right? Um, if I'm going too fast, I can slow down. Um, the cactus shapes, I didn't add any of the tuna. Right, but you get the, the kind of overall feel for it and also some of the color sensibilities. Um, I was doing treatments for you, right? Rather, I didn't make you a letter, but I could, I mean, I, I can make you a letter. I'm gonna make you a letter. Um, the gear shape, um, that's probably, that's really heavy for me to lift it up. I'll lift it up here. Um, don't, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> oh, I won't. <laughs> I don't wanna hurt yourself. <laughs> What letter is that going to be used? That would be I, and then also we're not, I have another gear. Um, I tried to do doubles, but we have double letters. So the only single standout is actually the uh, the plow disc, right? And then 
Soybrum, right? We also looking at sugar cane, right? Uh, yeah, cotton, different structures. But yeah, if you look at my initial concept, um, only I is here, right? And then <coughs> the are the spherical shapes, and then cacti, cacti, and then we were kicking around Soybrum, and then also kind of blue bonnets, but I could show you with that shape. So it's basically a, a mixture between kind of welding and blacksmithing. So if you heat a piece of metal up hard enough, you can really do unspeakable things to it. So if you take a whole window weight and you get it really, really hot, you can hammer it and shape it into um, something that looks like a blue bonnet. Right? Um, I guess in the initial meeting we talked about it. Uh, I own the old Plaza Hotel, so I'm, I'm two doors, or I'm two blocks away from uh, where the structure is actually going. So maintenance, making sure it's okay, uh, checking on it constantly. Uh, I'm around and I mean, Laura can tell you we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I work for the Harlingen Independent School District. I'm the art teacher over at uh, Gutierrez, right? So mm -hmm. I got an MFA from the school, oh, I'm sorry, um, University of Texas San Antonio. And then my BFA is from the School of the Institute of Chicago. So we've been at this a long time. Um, questions? Yeah, I question. So, have you coordinated with the downtown district? Yes, we did bring this to the downtown district, and it, it passed. <coughs> so they they have agreed to have the letters and Mr. Alex Cominos as the artist to design it, to make it more unique, not just Times New Roman font. <laughs> Anything? Are you worried about building roads? <laughs> My best friend. <laughs> okay. Does anybody wouldn't. have any other questions? Uh, about no, the my, my, my about the project, uh, I, I, I would ask um, again: is is I don't know what the total cost is or what, but uh, to invest that kind of um, artistry and, and your talent, it's worth it to protect it. Right? I mean, invest in the prep work, uh, in painting and all that. In my in my opinion, that's where the most money should be spent for the long term. Get the life out of the out of the. the Obviously, I think it's going to be an awesome project and whatnot. I would just uh, don't want to um, buy cheap materials or cheap prep work. It, 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 it's a very cool idea, and, and, and if it's going to represent us, you got to put the time in, I think. So if, if, if there's a budget constraint, maybe we can bring it back to the commission see where, or get with Gabe and see what, what is that we can do to do it right the first time and not have to put all that work and then in a couple of years, man, we should have done this or this. Mm -hmm. The project cost for this is $25,000. We can check into the uh, powder yeah, I mean, coating. The, the, I mean, because <clears throat> the, 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 the labor to do all that, the same. The cost of materials will go up, but the longevity of, of, of the value of it, I think, will long we'll, extend itself. We'll and check in into that cost. If it's substantially higher, we'll bring it back for the I mean, question. I mean, it's a beautiful idea. And obviously, you're very talented. What, what's the, powder? Uh, powder, coating? powder coating? Powder coating versus car paint. Sure. Uh, powder coating on a smaller piece of metal is going to give you a durable surface. Automotive paint is going to give you a durable surface. Powder coating, you're running um, electrical current through a piece of metal, and then basically you're going to use heat to chemically kind of adhere a surface to it. But you want to be perfectly honest? If I want to damage it, I'm still going to be able to damage it, right? Um, so. I mean, I'll be honest with you, right? If you want to spend another $25,000 for a coating that makes you feel better, that's still going to get damaged, uh, waste the 25 grand. Okay, so, so if somebody scratches uh, car paint or scratches powder coating, the effect's still the same? Well, no matter if you, so with the automotive <laughs> paint, I walk down the street and I go, oh, bad people, and then I call the city and I let you know that we're going to go touch it up. And then we go touch it up. If it's powder coated, we have to get a plasma cutter, cut the thing back off, lift it up, transport it back to wherever you had it powder coated. It's, I'm not taking care of the powder coating. I'll, I'll take care of the automotive paint, right? Um, well, my so concern is, is is not so much the, 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 the paint. It's the like the gauge of it. The, the you know don't. Um, oh, I'm not I'm get, not get, going with cheap metal. All my all my stuff's going to come from Rio or it's going to come from King, okay. right? I'm, I'm not. Um, pick one of those up. 
pick, pick one of my mockets. No, don't do that. No, 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 <laughs> right, um, I, I wouldn't do that to you, and also I wouldn't do it to me, right? Like, end of the day, I mean, I have the old Plaza Hotel. I'm two blocks away, and then also, like, I mean, yeah, Bill DeBrook's a really good friend of mine. Lars Klein's a really good friend of mine. I basically have to do a good job because Harlingen's my city. So not even to this committee, I'll never hear the end of it. So okay. I would, I would never do that to myself. Is there, is there a motion to uh, authorize the uh, city manager to sign the contract? Motion. Second. A motion to second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. The motion carries. Good luck. Sounds like a great project. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, but it's uh, <laughs> well, we'll get the blue right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Item six, consideration of possible actions to select the highest ranking firm and authorize the city. Uh, the interim city manager to negotiate and execute a contract for architectural services and project management for Central RFQ 2021-20 for the Tony Butler Golf Course renovations. Javier? Yes, yes Mayor, City Commission. Um, so you all heard the presentations. Um, the evaluation committee had ranked uh, Golfscape uh, number one, uh, Jeffrey Bloom number two, and Ross Golf Design number three. Um, and so they had to meet a certain criteria. Um, that's what the evaluators based it off of. Oh, and so, so go over the, the ranking again. I'm sorry. Who did you have number one? Number one was uh, Golfscape Inc. That was the second presenter. No, first and presenter. Number two was Jeffrey Bloom. And number three was Golf uh, Ross Golf Design. Can, can so you the, per, the first presenter is who, who, you, who you rank number one? I'm sorry. The first presenter is who you rank number one. Yes, sir. Ambiotic. I'm sorry. Was that wasn't that their name, Ambiotic? Or did I look no, no, that was their engineer, Ambiotech. Oh, yeah, I got confused. Yeah, screwed up. All right, but yeah, the first the first presenter was uh, was the number one uh, ranked choice by the Harlington team, and the second ranked was the la was the last yeah, team that presented. All right, so. I'll make a motion um, to go with presenter number one is number one is the pick. Okay. Wait. Oh, I, I actually, go ahead. Um, may, I, may I want to ask a question, if you mind? Oh, no, I want to hear from Jeff. I want to hear what Jeff had to say. Is he here or did he leave? <laughs> but his ranking is on the... Um, if that's uh, on the table. Okay, there was a there was a, there's a lot of conversation here. I think we need to sure. probably eliminate that. Uh, what what's the we have a motion yeah. that uh, Commissioner Mesmore, but I did uh, I didn't hear a second. Uh, what was your motion, Ma Commissioner? To Biden? appoint the person who presented first, who was recommended first by the team oh, that that's, put this together. That's gol golfscapes. 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 And, uh, to I'll be, second. To be the golf course architect. Hmm. I'll second. All right. Now we have a motion and a, and a second. Is there any discussion? <laughs> all right. Uh, hearing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Opposed. Aye. Opposed. Okay. That was three to two. Yes, sir. Opposed. You, you were, yes. Nay. Yeah, it, you it, were nay. Okay, lost. and you two, and sure. both of you were nays. Yes, sir. All right. <coughs> then, what the, do you want to appoint any, do you all want to appoint anybody? I, well, I wanted to discuss it, uh, have a discussion on it. I, I like the third presenter, and I like the second presenter as well. He's very detailed. But the third presenter had, if you look at the scope of work of what they've done, and that's just my opinion of what, I mean, Texas A&M, you know, in the list of projects they did done in Texas here, uh, that's a lot of projects. And I really like the fact that they showed you before and after pictures. Actual work, this is what it looked like before, that's what it looks like now. Uh, they're very detailed, and that, that's, that's, that was, that's what I liked. What, what I liked about the first one um, was that he's the one that actually went into show pictures and, and is really aware, aware of the, the drainage mm -hmm. issue that they're going to be having. And also I liked how he says the possibilities. Like I, I, how you mentioned how there's a possibility for the driving range. Again, it's not, he said, it's not in the budget, but that's a possibility for Understood. extra revenue. 
and I, th I thought he was giving more representation of possibilities, not just of the of the of what they're going to do, but possibilities that we could also further look into. Right. Yeah. So we want, you know, we, we need to select we need to select somebody. So even though we just so do you have a recommendation? I, 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 the I'll first make, uh, motion yeah, did I'd not like pass. Recommend. Hang on, hang on, one at a time. So uh, the first motion didn't pass. You can, that motion can be made again, or another motion can be made, and and, you, uh, and we can continue to discuss it prior to making the motion. Whatever y'all want to do, I think they're both excellent firms. I think both. I think the. Uh, I I would like to make the motion that we select the third presenter. As, as okay, the third presenter was Jeffrey Bloom, Jeffrey Bloom. and they were ranked. They were. They were ranked number two. Number two. Yes. Now, do we need? Do they need to? Do we need to pick more? Do we need to pick more than one? I would, Mayor, just so that if uh, we can't negotiate with the first one, then we can move on to the well, second I, one. Yeah, I can make that motion. That, that we'll, that I would I'd like to see you negotiate with the third presenter first, and then if they don't work out, they go with the first presenter. Second. Okay, so that's the motion to. Per, uh, it, it, the motion is to rank. Uh, Jeffrey Bloom first and Golfscapes second in order of presentation and authorize the city manager to uh, negotiate the contract with, with them at, in that order if necessary. So that was your motion. That was your second. All, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Opposed. Thank All you. right. The motion carries. Item 7. Consideration of possible action to approve an ordinance on first reading to amend the City of Harlingen Comprehensive Plan, one vision, one Harlingen <coughs> thoroughfare plan by adding the extension of November Lane east of Cook Lane. Yes, Mayor, City Captain Commissioners, Dustin. good evening. This was tabled uh, on September 15. This item was tabled, so those, those need to be remo removed from the table. Does the item need to I be removed? I couldn't hear you, Javier. What? This was tabled on September 15. Does the item need to be removed from the table? I, I thought it, it didn't pass. No, it was tabled. Table. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We need a motion to remove the item from the table. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. The item's off the table. So how do you Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, it was tabled uh, due to uh, drainage concerns. Uh, the drainage report is in your packet. Uh, the engineer is proposing to exceed the ordinance requirements for drainage. Uh, so the tougher plan amendment is for, for your consideration. I have a question, Javier. Is it normal for us to give um, kind of making exceptions for to the third plan, like to let any uh, developer or, or somebody just to make uh, amend our third plan? Is that no, like it's a it's an application. Uh, we we get those occasionally from developers, and it's the city commission's uh, discretion whether to approve them or not. Or not. How often do we get those? Um, we have we have one last year, and then I think we have one bef one year before that. They're not very often, Commissioner, but but we do get them on occasion. Has it ever been this developer that's asked for an, uh, an amendment? No, I don't think so. No, no, no. it's the first time he requests one. Yeah, I'm just opposed to the idea because that area floods tremendously. Excuse me, could you speak into the microphone? I said I'm a. Yeah, I said I'm just opposed to it because that area floods horribly, right? And I didn't, I didn't want a repeat of what happens in my neighborhood on a brand new construction, and we have a really bad flooding problem right behind where I live. So uh, I, I just wanted more uh, stricter standards on uh, to try to prevent that. It there's, a detailed, there's a detailed drainage plan that was uh, included in the documents that are, that are in our packet. So, so they're and complying the, And with the engineer drainage. is here, and he could... <coughs> And he can address that Sir, we drainage came, issue. We just came back from TML, and one of the things I learned that most cities are not going to a 100-year plan, a 100-year plus one day. And, and that particular company actually does business in Harnigan. They have an office here in Harnigan, which I had no idea. But it was great to meet them, great to talk to them, and that's what they do for a living. So we're at a five-year plan, I think, right? This is a five-year plan? No, it's not. The, the, what are, what are the... the, the <coughs> What are the codes for that development? 20, they, for this size of the subdivision, they're proposed, the ordinance requires a 25-year detention, but they're proposing to exceed, right. to so, exceed so that. So what, what I learned at the conference last week was 
most cities are moving to a 100 year plan plus one, right, plus one day. And, and so that's, that's where I had hesitations on it. And I mean, you all can discuss it or do how you do it, but that's, that's, that's how I, I feel. So, so do you wish to stop all city construction <laughs> until we change our law? No, I just want to make sure that, 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 that what we are, we can't continue to keep adding to the problem. We, we, the, the 25 year, whatever we have right now is not working. It doesn't work. If I hear again, oh, this was an anomaly. We just had a rain event two weeks ago and we got flooded horribly. Our new, our new uh, the ninth and thir 13th district project that is brand new uh, uh, flooding got flooded. Okay, so I don't, I don't know. I'm not the, I'm not an engineer. I just know that that's not working. Well, so well, we have to seriously, here. seriously work, work on improving that and whatever that takes. Javier, was there a, a change from the last time uh, we met before we tabled? Did they change, make some changes? No, they, no changes. It's just we included the drainage report in your packet. Okay. Uh, the engineer is proposing to exceed the ordinance requirements. Um, so just more, more information has been provided. I mean, th this uh, isn't the subdivision plan, plan no. or, or, or a building permit. No. This is simply to change a document that regarding our, our thoroughfare plan. Correct. They, would, they still have to go through the, the rest of the process. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I don't know whether uh, <coughs> Mr. Moore wants to uh, uh, amplify uh, anything regarding the drainage information he supplied, but he's standing behind you. If he wants to, he, he's welcome to. There, I know last time there was some concern over how much the detention was in the packet with the drainage report. We showed what the 100-year detention would be, and we're providing twice that amount. So we're not providing the 100-year plus one day. We're providing twice the 100-year store, and it'll be with on-channel detention at the south end of the property. So... Let me ask you something. Uh, we had a situation in my neighborhood last year, year before, and everybody warned us not to let it pass. It got passed, however. Uh, Gabe, do you have an idea how much we've spent so far on the night on the 13th Street uh, Adams Crossing South <coughs> to repair that to that subdivision? And it still hasn't fixed it completely. But how much we've spent muscle minutes in, in dollar amount uh, on that? Commissioner, I don't have that. Do you? Uh, is the finance is Robert here? The <coughs> finance. Do you have a do you have a ballpark? Is it more than hundred thousand dollars? Oh yes, it's more than hundred thousand dollars, right? So I don't want the city on the hook for that, or the citizens on the hook for that. Uh, now, if you tell me, because because there's there's got to be some kind of accountability somewhere. Somebody should sign off, and if you're the developer and if you're willing to sign off, say you know what, I'm going to guarantee my work for X amount of years, not forever, but for X amount of years to make sure that that I got it built correctly within the standards. i again, I'm not an engineer. But for the new construction, and those are 200 plus thousand other homes, and they, they, they haven't been in there a year, and they're already getting, having a flooding problem in a brand new subdivision, I don't want to, because I'm pretty sure the, these lots are going to be nice, right? I mean, they're going to be expensive homes, nice. They're not um, um, cookie cutters, right? They're, they're, they're custom homes. Uh, we, I think we have a responsibility to make sure that we build it the best we can. And prevent the standards. Now, again, if you uh, you have like some kind of insurance and, or something that say, you know, I'm gonna back that up. If we fell in our drainage, if if it exceeded whatever it is standard that you build it to, uh, um, or uh, you know, do you understand what I mean? That, that, that if it falls below that, an event happened and we flooded, then somebody's gonna be held accountable. But not not the city of Harnison, not our citizens, not our not our taxpayer dollars. Okay. Uh, correct. And so, the first thing is this is in the ETJ. All of this will be county infrastructure. So it won't be a city street. It won't be city drainage. It'll all be Cameron County. So it's in the EDJ. It's not in the city. But and even the city requires it and the county requires it. The contractor has a one-year warranty. They're required to provide a 15% <coughs> maintenance bond if something were to break due to that. And most engineering firms carry a professional liability policy that if it did, if it was a storm less than what you designed for and it didn't work, then, I mean, we've worked for companies that they have had claims against their policy before. Yeah, so, so, again, 
I, I agree with the mayor on, on what he's saying because right now if this is not a about the drainage and this is not about the subdivision plan it's just to amend the thoroughfare it's just the first yeah meeting. so yeah it's not really about the and I agree with you totally okay. drainage and I want to go after on so let, let me ask this question well, let me finish first what I want to do is I do like I, in the next month or so I want to go after the our drainage policy I want to improve it my thing about this is just amending the thoroughfare that I, I, I don't I'm not, that's what I'm not comfortable with is like amending and letting developers just come in and just say, hey, you know, we're, we just want this change. And, but the thing is, I don't think it's a drainage issue or or um, or a, a subdivision issue because like the mayor's correct in what he's saying. No. I, well, here's where I disagree. Explain to me what happens if it doesn't pass. If it doesn't pass, we'll relay it in a way that the cul-de-sac will be shorter. Wh which means less shorter. homes, right? Correct. And, and, and again, so to me, it's like you're bypassing and working around the current, even that current standard, trying to get around it just so they can make, put more lots. And you're putting profits over um, well, the process. My opinion, I, and look, I get it. You're, you're trying to maximize your dollar for the lots that you're developing. It's a big, expensive process. But my thing is, I think people would pay more money per lot, making sure that it was built correctly not trying to squeeze every single square inch. If you understand what I'm trying to say, right? By, by doing this thoroughfare, they're going to be able to put more lots on there. That's all, all it about. It's a, and how many lots are we talking about? Two lots, three lots? I believe it's the whole subdivision, I believe it's 26. 26 more lots? No, total. No. What, so no, no, not 26 more, 26 total. I know. So my question is, if, if you had to relay it to, to not have to do the thoroughfare, how many lots are you talking about? What's the comparison? If you have 26 now, what's the... What's the 25. Right, so you're talking about for one lot. I think you can spread that cost of each lot. Uh, what are you, like $30,000 a lot, maybe? No, they'd be about fifty dollars to $60,000. Okay, $60,000 a lot on 20 lots. I don't, yeah, but, that, yeah, I don't, I don't that, get that. But that's not addressing a drainage issue. That's addressing uh, a, th th a thoroughfare. So, the, so this, the the staff has said, okay, what's the likelihood that we're, we're actually going to put that street through there? Uh, anytime soon, or or whether it could be moved, or whether it could be moved, and the staff has said it's okay to it's okay. We don't need we don't need this thoroughfare here. That's really what they're saying. Is they're saying it's okay to amend the thoroughfare plan. We can move the street. We can move the street over. No, there's no no, no. street is being no street is being moved. It's just we're adding to the thoroughfare plan this street because the subdivision requires uh, two entrances so the event when the, the 20 acres that he's developing is covers this area and then when the, when the property to the north develops then he has to connect here and then have the second entrance here so nothing is being moved it's just new torfers being added to the torfer plan to allow this subdivision, this subdivision to develop this way but, but there is a way he can do it without changing it. Yes, if, okay. this, if this doesn't pass, then the cul-de-sac will, it will be a cul-de-sac subdivision. The cul-de-sac will be here, and these lots will be much bigger. These lots remain the same, and then these lots become much bigger because the cul-de-sac will end about here. I understand. So, so that if we deny you making the U Street, then that cuts into the potential profit of the people who want to develop this. And so the city would be um, anti-profit, uh, <laughs> or would the city be anti-building? And, and, and excuse me, I'm speaking. Um, would, uh, would the Valley Morning Star, Fernando, put in the headline, um, Harlingen City Commission makes it difficult to build in Harlingen? And this is, isn't even in Harlingen, it's in the county. Well, I, I, like, I would like the Valley Morning Star to print that we have high standards, not minimum standards. And I said that before. And our, and our citizens deserve more than minimum standards. Uh, they're on their drainage issue, which is the, isn't even a part of the project yet. They're just asking for permission. Right. But they've stepped up and increased drainage cap capabilities, and yet you're trying to put the kibosh on them developing this land. And find me a place in Harlingen or Cameron County or any coastal county in Texas does that, that does not flood 
with a heavy rainfall in a short amount of time or a heavy rainfall over a period of time. They all flood. West Virginia floods, Tennessee floods, uh, Arizona floods with heavy rains. Uh, it's just the dynamics of uh, hydrology. Okay. There's no way that we can prevent any land in Harlingen from flooding at any time with any significant amount of rain. In the last 10 years, we've put in over $20 million in drainage. It's not enough. We need a good another $80, $100 million of drainage if you really want to drain this city. And, and so you're preventing commerce from taking place. You're preventing building from taking place. No, I'm just trying to set a higher standard, sir. They're, they are adopting a higher standard in drainage. And you're picking the higher standard for this project, but not for any other projects. No, it's, I've always been clear going So forward. you're going to stop all construction until we could change our, our uh, rules to 100 years in the day. I would like to do something like that, absolutely. But you, so you won't allow any construction I'm in the saying, meantime? You're, 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 this is a commission. It's not my decision. I'm going to vote the way I feel what, what I think is best for the city. Ditto. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, I'm going to ask the city attorney to read the caption, please. Uh, number seven. Consideration of possible action to approve the ordinance on first reading to amend the city of Harlingen comprehensive plan, one vision, one Harlingen thoroughfare plan by adding the extension of November Lane east of Cook Lane. Applicant Dustin Moore of Moore, Moore Land Surveying LLC. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt the ordinance? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Those opposed? Opposed. Opposed. All right. The motion carries. <laughs> Item eight is consideration <laughs> and possible action to approve a resolution amending resolution number 2020-24, removing Dan Yeltsetana, former city manager, as designated signatory in the city of Arlington bank account. Good evening, Mayor, City Commissioners. Um, item number eight is a formal resolution to remove uh, or to replace uh, the former city manager with our inter interim city manager, uh, and that resolution is required by, by Frost Bank. Okay, is there a motion to uh, approve the resolution? Motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. The motion carries. Item nine, consideration of possible action. To approve a resolution amending resolution number 2019-43, removing Daniel Santa, former city manager from the facsimile signatures for checks drawn on the city's uh, checking accounts at the city's depository bank. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Is there any, uh, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. The motion carries. Item 10, consideration possible action to approve a resolution supporting a venue project, multipurpose arena by uh, Cameron County. Um, Mayor, members of the commission, Commissioner David Garza, County Commissioner yeah. David Garza. I want to wel welcome uh, Commissioner David Garza. Thank you for being here. And Pete Sebulvida, Pete, welcome. Thank you for being here. Ready to go? Good. Yes, thank you. First of all, I want to make sure I clear one thing up with you. I am here to be informational to you. I'm not here to advocate for or against the project. Our role, once we declare this to be put on the ballot, is to just inform people of what can happen if this proposition passes. So that's for the record. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor and Commissioners, for your time this afternoon and for allowing us to present to you a project that Cameron County has been working on. We are looking at proposing to have on the ballot in the November election a proposition to add a project to current venue projects that we already have. The project that we want to add is a event center, multi-purpose arena, call it by whatever name needs to be called, but this this event or arena center will have a sitting capacity of about 10,000 people. We have done a feasibility study. I'm sorry. Oh, that's the. We have done a feasibility study. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have done a feasibility study. I'm used to talking with a mask on. <laughs> you know. We have done a feasibility study that tells us that this project can be financially supported by the venue tax. 
The venue use, of course, is multi-purpose, entertainment, <laughs> concerts, sports, community events, graduation activities, and any other such events that the community would have. We're also including an area on this event center parking lot so that we can create a hub for evacuation purposes when we have to evacuate folks and you require a lot of parking with buses that are used to evacuate people from the different towns in case of a hurricane event or a flooding event. The area impacted by this event center is all of Cameron County, all of the Rio Grande Valley, and a large part of northern Mexico, which is a population base of about four million people. The funding for this is a visitor or venue tax. The visitor or venue tax is something that is in place already in Cameron County. There is no local property tax increases associated with this project. There is no local tax dollars that are to be spent on this project. The venue tax that we passed, or you passed, that supported this in 2017, has already allowed us to build two venue projects. The venue tax is a tax that is charged to visitors that come visit Cameron County from outside of the area. And the venue tax is a tax that is added on to vehicle rentals and hotel and motel stays in the area. So there is no increase to that. We're already collecting that tax and it is going well for us. The idea of this venue is of course to in create more economic opportunity for all of Cameron County. The location of this project is right smack in the middle of Cameron County. It sits on the intersection of Highway 100. Pete, if you could go to the next one, please. Well, it sits in the intersection of Highway 100 and I-69E, which is an area that is south of Highway 100 and east of the interstate. There is a 1,330-acre tract there that is being master planned for commercial and you know, medical, all kinds of different opportunities there. And that master plan that is being privately developed is allowing the county to use 23.3 acres of property for this VNU project at no cost to us for the use of that property. The use of this property includes the infrastructure leading to it from both the interstate and Highway 100. Um, We've done this before. This is not a new thing for us. We created an event center on South Padre Island in Isla Blanca Park. It, it consists of an amphitheater and of course the inside climate controlled events center. The outdoor venue has been used extensively up until COVID began and now more so since things have been, you know, they've allowed us to have more concerts there. Uh, the uh, sitting in that amphitheater that already exists, which is the one on the left there, and I hope all of you have visited, is about 5,000 people. You know, the uh, inside sitting of the event center is about 300 people. The South Texas Ecotourism on the right, which is gonna be completed hopefully in about a month, is another project that, again, the project is, we all know and we heard all about the birding and all of this, which is fantastic. This is just another, another place that folks can go to and enjoy nature. We've recreated four ecotourism areas. We are encouraging and doing everything possible to invite birds to visit this site. It is right across from Laguna Vista on the south side of Highway 100. It's a nature-based park, ecologically diverse and there's classroom instruction, school and learning and educational opportunities. And again, I wanna stress to you that we are already collecting the tax for the venue by assessing that vehicle tax. Uh, I know that we had one question brought up from the city of Harlingen in regards to where the tax comes from. Where is this visitor tax coming from and who's paying for it? Well, visitors pay for the visitor tax. We could not segregate the data for car rental tax information. It is reported by the state comptroller's office in aggregate as Cameron County. We do know that if we take the last 12 months of that car rental tax, it was about almost $900,000 for the year. 
we also know that from the state comptroller's office, we are able to segregate data from hotel usage. Harlingen, the city of Harlingen generated 19.7% of last year's tax collected, which totaled $1.78 million for Cameron County in the last 12 months. We collected $351,446.37 in the city of Harlingen with that visitor tax. Um, I want to open myself up to any questions that I might answer. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, the, the thing is, there was a person earlier here that told me, we don't want your center. It's going to cost us money. It's not going to cost taxpayers any money. This is totally, this is not any different than the AT&T Center in San Antonio. How do they fund these large venues in the cities? Visitor taxes. It's nothing new. Same thing in Austin. Many of the centers, of the large event centers, are funded through the visitor tax. Many of the cities and counties across the state of Texas, AT&T Stadium included, are all visitor tax-based venues. You know, We are just utilizing, first and foremost, encouraging economic development, increasing our tax base here locally, and at the same time, creating jobs and economic opportunity for all of us that are already here. So that is, in a nutshell, what I would like to tell you all, but I want to open myself up to questions that either Peter or I could answer. I have a few questions if I sure. may. Sure. Um, what you're seeking is permission to put this on the ballot? No, it, it will be on the ballot. Oh, it's already on the ballot. We're informing you that it will be on the ballot. Okay. Yeah, we already have two projects on, those projects were already approved by the voters of this county. All we're doing is adding another project to that list that we can fund. And we have the historical data of the revenues now for the last four years, so we know the ability and how much capacity for bonding we have. And, and, and you're talking about visitor fees, visitor taxes. Right. So this will increase the hotel visitor tax, county tax? No, it will not increase it. We're already it'll, collecting it'll it. It will stay at the same. It stays at, we cannot increase it. The okay. state has a maximum that you can set that at. Okay. It cannot be increased. You know, all we can do is utilize the proceeds from that tax and buy more bonding capacity to be able to fund projects. Okay, so same question on uh, car rental. Yes, sir. Again, the same question, there is no increase. The same answer is, is you're not going to increase taxes. No, sir. It's already set at what it okay, is. So I'm confused. Yes, sir. Um, you're already getting money. This is already on the ballot for people to approve the use or disapprove of the use to, of, of existing and future tax monies mm -hmm. um, to build this facility. Why are we involved? What do you want from us? From the city of Harlingen? Yeah. We want a resolution that would support it if that's what you would like to do, okay? And the idea here is we are not adding any more taxes to anyone's bill. All we're doing is every venue project that is approved by a county or a city in the state of Texas has to be approved by the citizenry of that particular political subdivision. In this case, the county is proposing to do this, and just like we had those other two projects that were approved and passed, we're asking to be considered for this to be approved and passed by the citizenry. We are here to inform you of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We are hoping that we can have a resolution passed by you in support of this project. We believe that it will put more heads in beds in our hotels all across the South Texas area, including Harlingen. We are hoping that we can increase the... Uh, you know, the flights coming in and out of Harlingen and have more car rent. Uh, you know, all of these things compound each other and, and, and help. And this will be an arena, um, in, indoor arena. for Indoor everybody. arena, yes, and sir. And will there be a hotel with there this? There most likely could be. We, don't, we are not developing anything on the accessories around this, but the developer, who is Madeira out of Brownsville, could possibly, you know, there's 1,330 acres, okay? We're utilizing about 23 for what we want. Okay, so, so should the citizens in November approve the use of this money, then adjacent on private 
private land that's not been allocated to 23 acres, not allocated to the county, somebody could build a hotel. There. Hotels, medical office buildings, commercial yeah, yeah, restaurants, yeah, yeah, et cetera. Okay. Residential areas, okay. a lot of residential areas, I imagine, in the area. Yes, sir. Is a, excuse me. Yes, is sir. Is a feasibility study available? Yes, sir. Can we have a copy? I believe you, you know, it was still in the draft form. It's, oh, we can, I'm sorry, what? We have an executive summary of the feasibility study. It is not complete. They had done a feasibility study and had not included any of the things that you just mentioned, Commissioner Melzer, you know, like ancillary products or services or hotels or retail that would be built up around this area. But we can send you the summary of what we've got. Yes, sir. Instead of getting the summary, could we get a complete? It's not complete yet. Well, once it's completed? Of course you can. Okay. It's a public record once it's completed. Well, when will it be completed? Probably another month and a half or two. You know, it's a pretty After extent. the election? Yes, sir. <laughs> this is sort of like Nancy Pelosi. You need to vote on it before I can tell you what's in it. No, it not, has nothing to do with that because the feasibility study includes, once we did the feasibility study for this arena, you know, the folks that are developing this property said, well, what will happen when we add other things that surround it? And what will that do to the value of the properties there, the tax values, ad valorem tax values, and things of that sort? So as a result of them adding that to the scope of work of the project, you know, that piece is not completed yet. So I, ca I couldn't tell you what a stripes on the corner of Highway 100 and I-62 will generate in sales taxes because we don't have that. Those are the type of things that they're now adding on to the study that they did on the feasibility for the event center. And is, you know, is that's- the, is, is the location of the project in the city limits of the city of Brownsville? To yeah, my it, estimation- it is, it is, right? It's in that area. Yeah, there's, yeah. I think there's 1,280 feet in the front of the frontage road on either both Highway 100 and Interstate 2. And the- the project five percent on the car rentals is that that's already being collected, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and the hotels too. Yeah. Well, I yeah. knew the, I knew the hotels. I wasn't quite. I wasn't certain about the car rental, but that was yeah. when you passed the venue tax in 2017. Yes, sir. Okay. This is just adding to the bonding capacity for the venue tax. There is no there is no tax implications to a property owner to a homeowner, to a business owner. On the contrary, we hope that all these folks, especially businesses, can benefit from increased traffic and increased economic activity in our area. Okay, does anybody have any other, uh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Ma just, Mayor, can I, may I ask him a question? Uh, what happens to the venue tax if this project doesn't pass? If it doesn't pass, it's still there. When we pay off the current debt, it would go away, okay? unless we put up, but any project that we can bring to the table has to be voter approved. There, we can't do anything without voter approval. The idea is the public has to either decide to buy in or not buy into the project. You know, if, if my understanding from the preliminary data that I looked at, you know, this development will probably be, you know, 20 years from now, have about a $1.2 billion tax base which is significant. It's about a 5% increase from the current value of Cameron County for that matter, you know. So, you know, we, we have to look positively on these things and look and see if, you know, hotels are hotels and they're going up everywhere and they're filled everywhere, you know. Uh, restaurants are full everywhere. And opportunities to give our merchants that own these establishments an opportunity to access dollars that normally they wouldn't, is great. How much is this project going to cost? This particular project, the event center, probably a hundred million dollars, sir. Excuse me. You ever ask a question? Please do. Okay. Um, currently, South Padre Island has a combined hotel occupancy tax of 17 percent. Right. And as you know, state law, the county can't impose an additional hotel occupancy tax, which would increase the hotel occupancy tax in any city in the county. Above 17%. So how, how would that not increase South Padre Island's combined? It does not. It's already in, included in that percentage, sir. So you're saying it's not going to affect it? No, sir. As a matter of fact, 
Harlan, uh, South Padre Island passed a resolution last week in support of this. They feel that it will impact their heads in beds and, and stays on the island. They say, look, it's not in South Padre Island. Believe, we don't yeah, I believe South Padre Island passed a venue tax at the same time right. that the county passed a venue tax. And so of the 2%, the county's only getting half of a percent from South Padre Island. Yeah. Uh, South but Padre it will Island. not be increased. You know, that stays the same. There's no, no increase. Nothing changes that is not ongoing today with the current venue tax to fund this project. Yeah, I sounds like a great project, but if there's no feasibility study, how can they vote on something that they don't have total information on? There is a feasibility study for the event center itself. The feasibility study that is being scoped out and included to that feasibility study includes the impact but, of but the 1,300 and so acres that are surrounded. If okay? I hear you correctly, the feasibility study is in process. It's not completed. Right. And we, but we can give you the feasibility study as it relates to the event center. Is that completed? Yes. Then it's a, it's a, do we, we have we, it? We had a scope for that study as we were developing it. You know, additional scoping was added to it to re, I mean, we feel that if it, if the additional scoping and the additional feasibility of 1,300 more acres that will be developed is included in the feasibility study, not only will that help this project, but it'll help all of Cameron County and the whole surrounding areas in potential economic development and new tax dollars to come you, into us. Do you think you'd have the executive summary of the feasibility yes, sir. study we can done send it to you next Wednesday? The executive we can send to you by probably tomorrow. Okay. Well, we have a we have another meeting on the we have a meeting next week, which is the, on the nineteenth, a week from uh, week from Wednesday. Maybe maybe it would be helpful to the commission to sure. see the to see the executive summary from the feasibility we can, study. We can send that to you. That's not a problem. Yeah, but I mean, I'm fine if you know, if, you know yeah. but whatever the commission wants to do, if they want to table? pass the resolution tonight, or they could t or we could table table it uh, pending the receipt of the and then table it for the next. Uh, okay. Take it up. Uh, I'm motion to table. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, Mike. Like Thank so. you so much for <laughs> allowing me the opportunity to give you some information. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank All right. Thank you very much. Item 11 consideration of possible action to approve a resolution of the city of Harlingen joining with the state of Texas and political subdivisions as a party in the Texas opioid settlement agreements secured by the Office of the Attorney General. Mayor, members of the commission, uh, the city of Harlington is scheduled to receive approximately $165,429 from the opioid settlement. That'll be received over a period of about 18 years. Uh, the funds can only be used for education out and outreach and prevention programs. So by adopting the resolution, we'll be able to access those funds for those purposes. So staff recommends approval. You'd like, and we would take that money and maybe like Boys and Girls Club or different. Uh, well, uh, uh, it would have to be for opioid. Uh, right, right. Uh, but um, we would be able to take that money and invest it into education. Right? I mean, it's an education. Education about the, about the prevention of opioid use or the dangers of opioid use only. It'd have to be specifically for that. So uh, can it be used for the treatment of, of, uh, of like yes. a, a facility that, that, that does that already? That, yes. Okay. Anything is prevention or treatment of opioids can it can be used for that, but not cocaine or meth or heroin. No, heroin's no. an opioid. It's got to be an opioid. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, how much money? One hundred and sixty-five thousand four hundred twenty. Over what time span? About eighteen years. It's That's not chunk be, change. Yeah, not gonna be very much, but thousand dollars. It's a thousand dollars a year. There's no motion for an approval. But there's, uh, there's no obligation on our on the no. city's part. We don't. We're not obligated to do anything. It's just if we if we opt in, uh, it I think it helps them with their, and there could p potentially be more money. It helps them yes. with the uh, ability to settle the case. Plus, the, the, the state is uh, setting aside additional funding that we can apply for eventually if we have programs that need more funding. Yeah. So, uh, motion for an approval. Second. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries. 
item 13, consideration, consideration of possible action to select an energy provider for the city of Harlingen. We skipped 12. Hmm? We skipped 12. Yes, I did. Item 12, consideration of possible action to approve an ordinance on first uh, reading repealing ordinance number 13-19 and establishing section 2-436 of chapter 2 of the Harlingen Code of Ordinances providing that certain city boards meet and conduct every regular meeting of its members after 5 p.m. on any weekday and any reasonable time on weekends to increase public participation and attendance at city board meetings, providing a savings clause, providing a severability clause, or any other matters pertaining to the foregoing. Um, Mayor, this item was asked uh, to be placed on the agenda by Commissioner Pettis. We had something like this similar before where we had the meetings, uh, the city boards meet after 530. So this item would actually have them meet after 5 o'clock. Um, I think the reason for putting this on the agenda was to try to get more participation in the, in the various boards by the public. So um, unless you want to add anything to that, Commissioner, I, I think that's... Yes, I, I believe this would also give a little bit more transparency to what goes on in the city. I mean, um, we have some boards that meet at 8 o'clock in the morning and some that meet at 11 in the, in, you know, in the morning as well. And if you're an average working person like myself or thousands of others here in Harlingen, you can't attend those meetings. And I mean... You can see the, the, when they do post them, you can see them on YouTube, but by then all the decisions have been made. You can look at the minutes, but the minutes really only, only provide us a summary. So I think by moving the meetings after 5 p.m., um, this will give more uh, transparency to the process on what some of these um, boards do, and it'll get people more involved. Okay. Uh, can I ask the city attorney to read the caption of the ordinance, please? Is there a motion to adopt the ordinance? Motion to approve. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, the motion carries. Item 13, consideration of possible action to select an energy provider for the city of Harlingen. Um, Mayor, members of the commission, we went out for RFQs and uh, we received the, the uh, let me first cover this. The uh, RFQs asked for wholesale energy pricing, uh, importantly to cover the ancillary charges uh, leveraged by ERCOT and any nodal conge congestion charges. Uh, we did receive four responses, direct energy, TXQ, priority power, and uh, RAVE. What I've done is I've put the, uh, the quotes for the first column represents uh, a five-year term. The second column represents a 10-year term. Now, uh, unfortunately, with energy pricing is that we're going to have to have a, uh, either a meeting at noon or uh, you're going to have to give me authorization to actually pick a provider and then pick a range that we feel comfortable with. Uh, just to give you an example, these were due September 30th, and the, the five-year rate from direct energy, uh, I got a quote from them today, uh, went up to 0 .04077. There's a slight increase, and TXC also went up slightly to 0 0.04152 for the five-year rate. Uh, for the uh, the ten-year rate, direct energy went from a 0 0.037 to a 0 0.03968, and TXC went up to 0 0.03925 for a ten-year term. So there was some increase uh, in pricing for five and ten-year. What are we paying now? Uh, we're paying 0.389. Three eight nine. Yes. So, is, am I reading that right? Direct Energy has a savings of what we're paying now. Yes. Yes. And is that what you're recommending? Well, um, we would have to recommend a rate uh, within that range. Uh, it's what I would recommend. Now, the, the one thing with Direct Energy, though, is that they are through through TASB. It's a Bible. I know that we had some <coughs> questions about oh, yeah. TASB in the past. Yeah. Um, <laughs> TXU is with uh, um, Byboard, I believe. 
Uh, and just as a reminder, TXU provided the energy to, um, to Edinburgh and to FAR. Oh, and Eric Colt is here with TXU. Yeah, please, please come forward and identify yourself and... and Good evening, uh, Mayor Boswell, City Commissioners. My name is Eric Holtz, TXU Energy. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So <clears throat> I'd like to commend your efforts, Gabe's efforts, Robert, and uh, city staff for trying to get ahead of this. You're in a unique position that uh, a lot of your peers are probably very envious of right now. So we're seeing some skyrocketing near-term electricity prices as you've seen the rise of natural gas, which effectively drives the price of electricity 10 months out of the year here in Texas. Um, Y'all are getting ahead of this at the right time. Folks that are in city government that have contracts beginning January of 2022 or even June of 2022 are seeing much higher near-term electricity prices. I'm talking five or six cents per kilowatt hour. The market, the further out you look, is not as impacted by some of that near-term natural gas volatility. So you're absolutely doing the right thing. And especially with cities, you have great credit, you have a really good forward outlook, you have a lot of good buying power, which puts you in a great position to uh, take advantage of this market opportunity. So as Gabe spoke to, the pricing literally because y'all are 26,000 annual <coughs> megawatt hours of usage, changes every 15 minutes. So it's a, it's a real-time price because we're working with our sister company, Luminant, who owns about 25% of all the uh, generation capacity in ERCOT, as well as the trading desk from which we uh, leverage as our partner. So actually, the, the afternoon, just before I arrived here, I refreshed the pricing yet again and it was down a little bit from this morning. So that 10 year term was actually 3895, I believe. It's 0 0.0389855. So that's, and, a, that's a 10 year term. And, um, and, and we did cover, it's not gonna, uh, all the incendiary charges and all that stuff. That's all been deleted. Right, the, the pricing that they provided does cover incendiary, uh, congestion charges. That, that's correct. So the ancillary charges that were incurred from February storm URI or winter storm URI, th those are included in our pricing as well as the hub to load zone basis, which is also known as nodal congestion. So ha has legal been able to look at that? Um, we don't have a contract from them yet, just the pricing, but we'd have to ask for them to give us a, a proposed contract so that Mark could look at it before we signed anything. Okay, so questions. Yes. Those numbers n are no longer valid that September 30th. Oh, from any supplier, they would have expired. Correct. September 30th. Correct. Correct. Yes. And in the six to seven, eight weeks that we've been playing games, the natural gas, I, ha I have the natural gas features right here. There you go. It's up to a 14 year uh, yeah, high. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We're, we're uh, you know, without a calculator and just doing it in my head, energy prices have gone up about 35% from in, where in, we could have locked in uh, six, seven, eight weeks ago. Uh, I wouldn't call well, it natural gas right. features have gone. That's but, correct. But Mike, he, he just stated that you actually excuse went down me, a little bit. Excuse right? me, I'm, I'm asking questions. Yes, sir. We're, we're having a dialogue here. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so, so, so you don't approve of my dialogue? No, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay, so uh, it would have been better to lock in six, seven, eight weeks ago. Not necessarily. Okay. Um, the, the sharp increase that you're seeing is in the near-term pricing. So yes. it's really affecting, if you look at the energy prices for January 2022, February 2022, historically we would say 10 months of the year, electricity prices in Texas are driven by the cost of natural gas. The other two months, being July and August, are driven by scarcity. And that's essentially the outlook of, are we gonna have enough adequate generation to support the demand in the market. Following winter storm URI, it, it's almost taking on a new form where there's four months of the year that are challenged by scarcity because now we're layering January and February in. So the market is laser focused as to what's gonna happen this winter with regards to weather in Texas, what's going to happen in the summer of 2022 with regards to weather in Texas, and then fundamentally what is going to happen with this 
natural gas supply chain issue, which is a global phenomenon. Right, which is, which is why you hire actuaries and wizards. Correct. So y'all are in a great position because the calendar year 2022 is certainly impacted by all of these fundamentals. It has not yet breached calendar year 2023 and beyond. There's less liquidity in the market the further out you look. Um, so the prices, especially on a 10-year term, mm. they, they're not going to fluctuate as much. Now, the, the closer you get to that start date or that prompt month of January 1st, 2023, is when you're going to see more impact. So, so again... So, so you guys figure out backward date, backward date. It, it is absolutely backward dated, yes. The market's backward dated. So you have that unique buying position. Outside of the scope of just the commodity price, we actually want to partner with the city. So there's a lot of additional resources that we provide with our customers. A great example is you all got hit with a pretty nasty February electricity bill. Some of the other cities that we serve in the Rio Grande Valley, Edinburgh and Far, we actually gave bill credits during that storm period. We knew it, the event was coming. We reached out to their uh, city management and said, if there's anything you can do to curtail uh, during these hours on Monday, I guess it was Feb 12th. Um, and that's really effectively just raising the thermostat a degree or two during those periods. Well, we, we gave them several thousand dollars back on their invoices in, in form of a bill credit. Um, beyond the scope of that, we actually write into our electricity commodity contract an allocation of rebate dollars. Now, you can utilize that for anything that you're already making capital expenditure on with regards to energy efficiency. Earlier, there was a, a gentleman up here to discuss the new Harlingen sign downtown. Well, that's going to be LED lighting. So you can easily recoup those dollars for that LED spend uh, utilizing the rebates on our contract. And then furthermore, we have a fantastic partnership with Texas Trees Foundation. So if there's anything, it's like a whiteboard exercise that you can draw up conceptually that, hey, we want to put some trees around the signage at the plaza. Uh, that's something that we can work with our partner with Texas Trees Foundation to facilitate. We've done numerous tree plantings uh, throughout the Rio Grande Valley, Edinburgh, CISD. We've planted uh, quite a few trees at some of their elementary schools and then up in the uh, Corpus Christi area as well. But um, again, as far as the, the, the pricing is concerned, um, there's more near-term impact to the, the shorter terms. The 10-year term is not as impacted. Um, and then all of the other provisions are in that contract to give you full flexibility and, and a high level of comfort. Um, there's add-delete clauses for any new facilities that may be added to the uh, electricity contract, again, the rebate dollars, and then the ancillary charges, and the nodal congestion are fully hedged. And, and did I hear you correctly? You said you're owned by Sempra? No, no. So TXU Energy is a uh, part of the Vistra family of companies. We're headquartered. Vistra? Vistra. Okay. We're headquartered in Irving, and then um, Luminant Energy, our sister company, is the, uh, the largest generator in the state of Texas, again, with about 25 percent of all the generation throughout the state, it's a diversified fleet of um, nuclear, nat gas, coal, um, utility scale, solar, and one of the largest purchasers of uh, wind in the state. And then uh, TXU obviously is the retail arm that is tasked with finding a home for those uh, electrons that are being created. And then outside of Texas, we're actually owners of uh, Dynagy, which mm -hmm. operates in the Midwest and Northeast. I have a question. In reference to FAR and Edinburgh, did yes. you have a consultant? Or did they have a consultant in the city? <clears throat> they did have a consultant. That's correct. How much leverage or how much muscle did they use so they could, so you, TXU, the city of uh, FAR and Edinburgh, mm -hmm. worked it out to where they didn't pay what we're paying or what we owe? That, conceptually, whether... They used or did not use a consultant has no bearing. Uh, there's not a single scenario in which I could think we would have engaged a city directly uh, with a product structure that didn't have the ancillary charges fully hedged. That's, that's an answer that I wouldn't want to have to answer to mm -hmm. as to why there was a, you know, 640-some-odd thousand dollar pass-through charge. No, I guess, my, let me see if I can rephrase this. The consultant that they had. Yes. Okay. The city... 
the consultant, and TXU. They worked it out to where they didn't have to pay what we are what we owe. What I'm asking Gabe, and I'm asking you, mm -hmm. and I'm asking my fellow commissioners, I feel more comfortable making sure that we have the same consultant if at all possible, <coughs> so we won't find ourselves in a bad situation four years or two years or one year into a five-year contract. That's my preference. Right. I, me personally, 10-year contract, that's, we're asking for trouble. Okay. One of the uh, respondents that I'm, I'm seeing here is a consultant. So I, I know whether they had come to us for a pricing request or we had given it directly to the city, the product structure is going to be the same. So there's no um, essentially loopholes that we would write into the agreement that, I mean, fundamentally, I told Gabe up front, we want to ensure that the quote that we're giving you is not only as transparent as possible, but that we are protecting the city from the possibility of seeing a repeat of what happened in February. So when you go out to take bids for electricity, there's several different methodologies, one of which would be to hire a consultant, um, the other of which would be to tender your own RFP, which is effectively what the city has done. Uh, the third would be to leverage an interlocal, of which we're partnered with. Um, but each one of those, aside from the scope of going direct, bears a cost. So if you come to TXU or Direct Energy directly and say, give us your best price, we're going to put that offer forward. If you go to a consultant, they're going to reach out to Direct Energy or TXU Energy, say, give us your best price, then they're going to layer their fee on it and deliver it to the city. So that heavy lifting that they're doing up front is effectively giving the same contract, uh, except you're paying them a price that's bundled into that electricity rate every month for as long as the contract is good. So in terms of size, with 26,000 annual megawatt hours over a 10-year contract, it's roughly 260,000 term megawatt hours. If that consultant had a dollar per megawatt hour, or one mil, 0 .001 kWh, uh, that's effectively $260,000. For a um, period of 10 years, correct? That they're, they're paid back by the energy company over that 10-year period, correct? Or some negotiate otherwise, but um, essentially that's the... My understanding is their fee would be 26000 per year. But it, it varies. That's whatever would be negotiated. I was just using a hypothetical of, of $1. I mean, that, that can go it's, up and down. If I'm not mistaken, it's one penny... Per that one thousand, uh, that twenty. That's correct. Six million. Precisely. Precisely. What I'd like to do today is uh, one establish a provider that the city feels comfortable using, and then establish the, where they want to go to five or ten years. I would personally recommend five years, um, and then uh, establish a range that you feel. I'm, I'd rather like to be below uh, point zero three nine, um, if possible, but. I don't know what the market's going to be. So, so if I understand correctly, the, the point on the TXU Energy, the, the point zero three nine nine three is the five-year, and or is it reversed? Is no, that's the first column is a five-year. The second column is a ten-year. So it, it's a little bit cheaper to go ten-year, but you recommend the five-year. And that would commence after the, the uh, current contract. January 1st, 2024. Correct. So that's when it starts. Yes, correct. And then so we'd go five years out, so we did to 29. Yes. If you're, if you're seeking for, for optics perspective, any rates that are lower than four cents on the, on the latest refresh today, you'd be looking at 84 months. That's the, uh, the first term that, that comes in below uh, four cents. Effectively, the, the 12 month, and this speaks to the backwardation in the market. Actually, I didn't even price a 12 because it's so high, but a 36 month was uh, 4.3, 4.2 on a 41, 4.2 on a 48. And again. On a 60, it's what? The most updated one. Four two. I'm not suggesting that we sign a contract today because of the, the rates have gone up. I think we need to wait till the rates come down, uh, and if we pick TXU, then Eric's gonna have to monitor the rates daily to figure out when we can get. Uh, in, in, at, the, in the range that we want. Yes, to and and actually, what we have the ability to do because of our our capabilities and resources is effectively set a strike price for the city. So. Our pricing mechanism will kind of ping that daily until we find the market in line with the rate that you're chasing. And then in the interim, we'll need to get a contract from him so that Mark can review to see 
uh, there are any good. issues we're going to have to address. So, okay. so, so I, you're right. I'm sorry. Go, Go ahead. ahead. So I just want to make sure. So what we're doing today is we're just going to give Gabe the power to look at the rates, um, be able to sign, give him direction, five years, give him a range of the, you know, of how much it's going to be, and then once he sees it, he can just get it. Correct. And it, uh, yeah, and the, and the so it doesn't have to come back to us. He'll be good. We're we're, give, we're giving him the power to do that. That's what I want to do. Right. And Mark's going to review the contract yes, that they sent in the meantime to make okay. sure he doesn't have any issues. I'll make that motion. And, 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 and your um, your pricing changes. You said every fifteen minutes. Yeah, because of the size of the city, it's yeah. what we consider real time pricing. Yeah. So yeah. We're, I mean, it, it's good buying power for the city, Absolutely. right? Because you're taking that. No, no, no I fully understand. Yeah. Just right. just confirm it. Okay, sir. Well, we have a Clear. motion. Clear. Do you make a motion? I, I made the motion. Frank second. That, right. Was that to go with TXU? Correct. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. So you're making a motion to go with TXU or to just give him the power to choose a, a provider? Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I think you got two different things. You're, you're giving him the power to negotiate, then we can still talk about terms. If yeah. You're talking about awarding the yeah, because I don't want to award him the contract. I want to give a Gabe the power to do what he what he needs right. to do. Okay, that that I I, I motion whatever you. Said okay, so there. so we make I, a, I think I understood it the first time. So we I make want a motion. To empower him to go out there and get the best rate within that range. Within five years. With a five year contract, so that they get a contract struck, and, and as long as it, it's in that in, in the those terms that and the. Subject correct. To legal correct subject to legal approval, and then we're done. We don't have to come back. Okay. But did you did you state a range in your motion? Yeah, it, it's a, the, it would be um, what I'm going to recommend is uh, at that amount or lower than the, the point zero three nine nine three. Okay, that, that is that your motion? So moved. Second. All right. And any and other discussion? Yeah, and sir, um, I don't know anybody shorting the energy market. Uh, there are probably some people out there. You have a crystal ball. I do not. I can't speculate. Um, what I can say is that it's very concerning what we're seeing with natural gas prices. Um, and again, that's... They're, they're down in the last five days. Right. Right. Um, we'll see. I mean, there's a reason they built the LNG terminals up and down the Gulf Coast. Um, take that Texas gas, sell it overseas. They're regasifying it in Southeast Asia for their power plants. Um, We'll see where it goes, but it's uh, it's definitely interesting, especially what Europe is paying in natural <laughs> gas right now makes makes ours look pretty cheap. So, but all right, is there any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Appreciate your time this evening. Thank those, you. Those opposed, like sign. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, all right, the motion carries. Uh, item 14: Consideration of possible action to designate Rio Grande Valley Metropolitan Organization members for the City of Harlingen. Gabe. Um, Mayor, the MPO sent us this and requested that we, um, since Dan um, is no longer here, that we appoint another alternate.
right of executive session at 7 48 p.m. There'll be no action on item 17, no action on item 18, but we will take up item 19, discussion and possible action regarding the hiring, employment, and duties of a city manager. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we proceed going forward as is discussed in executive session of removing the interim title from uh, Gabe and making him our city manager pending um, uh, negotiations with um, the city attorney with the, in the parameters that we gave and pending the final approval of the contract to be brought back to the next meeting. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Congratulations, Gabe. Congratulations, Gabe. Good job, man. Okay, let's see this. No, I don't have one. 